to reconvene the meeting for the St. Mary's County Board of Education for Wednesday, December 12, 2018, and we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So since it is our first meeting in December, we have um, election of the board chair and vice chair. So I would like a, I'm asking for a motion to temporarily suspend the rules and have the secretary <coughs> treasurer, which is Dr. Smith, preside over the meeting for the purpose of the election of officers. I move that the board temporarily suspend the rules and have the secretary treasurer preside over the meeting for the purpose of the election of officers. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Well, you. Thank you very much. With the gavel. <laughs> <laughs> All the power. Uh, the floor is now open for nominations for the office of chairman. I nominate Mrs. Bailey to, um, uh, to the role of chairman. Mrs. Bailey, do you accept the nomination of chairman? Yes, I do. Are there any other nominations? All in favor of Karen Bailey for the office of chairman, signify by raising your hand. Congratulations, Mrs. Bailey. It's anonymous. It's anonymous. It's <laughs> unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know who raised their hands. Someone did. <laughs> now you're here. <laughs> That's the is, English teacher. Just saying. <laughs> this, this is why you don't give me the gift. Uh, the floor is now open for nominations for the office of vice chairman. <coughs> Kathy Allen for Vice Chairman. Woman. Mrs. Allen, do you accept the nomination for Vice Chairman? I do. Are there any other nominations for Vice Chairman? All in favor of Kathy Allen for the office of Vice Chairman signify by raising your hand. <coughs> Congratulations. The vote is unanimous. <laughs> uh, is there a motion to return to regular duties with Karen Bailey assuming the role of Board Chair? <coughs> I move a return to the regular rules with Mrs. Bailey assuming the duties. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oof. Mrs. Bailey, that's a lot of pressure. I don't know how, I don't, I just like sitting over here. Okay, thank you. And our next item is a motion to approve the agenda. I move approval of the agenda as presented. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried, and we will begin with board reports. Okay. All right. How are you? Thank you. I hope everybody's having a wonderful week. Happy holidays. It, officially, it is officially that time of year. Um, this week, and actually tomorrow, is going to be our second SLAC meeting, which is the Superintendent Student Leadership Advisory Com Committee or Council. And um, we will be continuing our theme of advocacy. We'll, we'll be talking about mental health and belonging. We'll have some guest speakers, and I think it's going to be a really nice time for the community to come together, share their thoughts and opinions, and work together to um, form or start working towards our youth summit at the end of the year. Thank you. This past week, I went to Park mm -hmm. Hall for their PE show. I've gone for the last several years. It is a lot of fun. Uh, Ms. Wood and Mr. Malone put a lot of effort into working with the students. What it is is they have an incentive to be able to stay after school one day a week to do physical fitness to music or routines. They do climbing the rope, um, they work on the mats, different dance moves. Um, and it is based on your behavior. So, you know, how well you're. Um, not just participating in class, but if you're being kind to another student, um, you know, just working as a team member. So, because they can't take everybody, there's limited space. So it's, it's a great incentive for the students. So I went uh, this past week to their presentation and it was all to Motown. And it was so much fun because I knew all the songs. <laughs> uh, and uh, the kids had a great time. The students that were watching had a great time. And um, there was a little girl sitting next to me and she was really into it. And I said, do you like this music? She, oh yeah, she had never heard it before. So, uh, but 
you know, the students had a great time. And like I said, those two teachers put a lot of time and effort into making sure that those students have a great experience. So. Um, last week I attended the Lions Visual and Hearing uh, Session. The Lions Clubs of uh, Southern Maryland uh, sponsor um, uh, a uh, session where we test uh, children from the first to uh, the sixth grade uh, for both vision and hearing impairment. Uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, my wife also helped. And uh, probably 10% of the kids had some issue either with their hearing or their vision. And uh, the, the role that we did was just to uh, basically uh, do a preliminary test and then we, we would refer if the kids didn't pass to, uh, to uh, their own um, a physician. Uh, also attended the joint meeting uh, yesterday with the Board of County Commissioners and uh, all the colleagues were there with Dr. Smith and uh, I'll let them relate uh, uh, to that issue. Uh, also attended the easement uh, holiday party. I want to thank you, Jill. The food was really good and um, you had promised me hard liquor but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I, it's, I still like the, 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 uh, the holiday. Thank you. And lastly, um, I mentioned, I think, a couple of weeks ago that we gave at Rotary uh, Clubs of Southern Maryland. I just received this this morning. These are thank you notes from the Park Hall students. There's probably 50, 50 notes here. I want to make sure that they get over to the Lexington Park Rotary Club. Mm -hmm. And uh, was, uh, the kids really seemed uh, very responsive in the free dictionaries that they were given. So. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Uh, we had obviously our joint meeting yesterday. It was very informative. We talked about uh, school safety, um, our CIP requests for the upcoming year and the changes that the uh, state of Maryland has made to the school construction process. And then we ended up with um, Dr. Smith summarizing the um, negotiated agreement that we have with uh, ESMIC uh, and what those funding requests might be for the upcoming year. So uh, it was a good opportunity for us to actually have a back and forth with the county commissioners since we don't necessarily always have that opportunity during the budget process. So I think it was it went pretty well. Um, let's see. I did attend a uh, busy time of the year for everyone. Uh, Letty Marshall Dent had a holiday extravaganza, I guess. So all of the uh, grades decorated Christmas trees, and then there was a silent auction. So there was a gift card tree, which everyone should take note on. It was, I think it was like $190 worth of gift cards. Uh, there was a snowman tree. Um, the pre-K classes did ornaments with their fingerprints on, which were pretty, which was pretty neat. Um, there was a Maryland tree, which we were the only bidder. So. We have a Maryland-themed ornament tree. Um, I'm trying to think. I think there was a gingerbread tree and one other one that I can't remember. But anyway, it was a, it was a good event. Um, it took place of their gingerbread auction just because they had some um, you know some personnel changes between the second and fifth grade, and I think it was getting a little. Um, it was a lot of work on the on the teachers and the parents who came in to help. Just imagine second and fifth graders attempting to build gingerbread houses. Um, <laughs> in the course of 45 minutes. <laughs> so as a former volunteer, tree idea, great. So um, very much enjoyed that. So and plus, I'm sure there's less illness at the school because the kids aren't eating the icing <laughs> and sharing it and all of the candies that were all spread out for them to decorate. So double, double, double win for Letty Dent. So your turn. Mr. Washington. <laughs> um, there were many, many activities going on in the school system, and it's always a busy time, whether during this season or when it's not this season. I will highlight one event, and that I attended the Dr. James A. Forrest Career and Technology Center National Technical Honor Society induction. And the seven attributes for being inducted into this society, skill, honesty, service, responsibility, scholarship, citizenship, and leadership. And to be considered for the Technical Honor Society, the students must have maintained a cumulative 3.25 GPA 
less than seven absences per year and have demonstrated a history of service, leadership, and character. And these standards must be maintained in order for the student to remain a member. And a total of 66 students were inducted. Congratulations to the students. Uh, Mr. Egan, the Hospitality and Tourism Program, Mrs. Johnson, Building Service Staff, Program Instructor, Culinary Arts Program, Mrs. Craft, uh, TV Video Production, and the Secretaries. It was a wonderful uh, presentation, uh, induction ceremony, and congratulations to all the students that work hard and all the sponsors who reviewed all of their applications and qualifications. Thank you. Um, I attended the uh, Madrigal Dinner put on by the Peace Pipers of Choptecon High School. Um, it's always a wonderful event. I, it is the kickoff of the Christmas season for me whenever, I, um, whenever I'm there, and um, this year, I was honored to be named uh, Lady Allen of Chaptico. Um, <laughs> Very quite, nice. I, I think the I, I was quite shocked um, to be to be called forward. Um, I also attended, along with all my colleagues, um, the swearing-in ceremony for um, those elected to office or re-elected to office. Um, was held at Leonardtown High School. It was a wonderful event. So, congratulations to Mrs. Bailey and to Mrs. Weaver. Um, very nice to have the whole group together um, for another four years. Fantastic. Congratulations. I just had one more thing on the Peace Pipers. Um, they were invited to sing at the White House yes. last Friday. Mm -hmm. So they did, so as people toured through um, to look at the Christmas decorations, they were providing um, the entertainment in, by song. So if anyone has not looked at the Chopticon High School Twitter feed, there are some gorgeous pictures of them. Um, that they, you know, as they sang throughout the White House yeah, uh, last Friday. So. Especially since the Peace Pipers, if you've not heard them before, seen them before, they're all in costume. They get to select their costumes um, and uh, create them. Create them. It's, it's um, very imaginative, and uh, you can tell the students take a great deal of pride in what they wear mm -hmm. and how they perform. They're really, Mrs. Lorick does an incredible job. And that's why she's teacher of the yeah. year. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. And they celebrated that greatly that night. So I had the singular pleasure of being with all of you for the majority of that. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Washington didn't mention, but uh, we went to see the importance of being earnest together. What a beautiful, really well done play. Guy Barbato and the Rose Players. They um, a challenging uh, uh, play of a comedy of errors and manners. Um, they just did a they just did a beautiful job. Uh, I will go all the way back to uh, the day after our last board meeting. In the evening, we presented to the NAACP, and we talked um, about a lot of the things that are going on in education. We specifically talked about uh, the challenges that we're seeing with recruiting and retaining teachers, all teachers, and, and also then diverse teachers as well. Uh, it is absolutely something that we have to recognize as a county, as a state, as a nation. We do not have enough people going into pursuing degrees in education. We do not have enough diverse people going into and pursuing uh, degrees in education. I know that the Kerwin Commission, as it moves towards a conclusion, and hopefully 2018 it won't conclude, but hopefully in the early part of 2019 it concludes, one of the major components of the four work groups is the professionalization of education and of teachers. I put to you that that's, we don't need to be professionalized. We are professional. What we need to be is recognized and compensated as the incredible gifted professionals that we are. Um, that was also a conversation that took place at the joint meeting where we had the opportunity to highlight the four-year negotiated agreement that we came together and worked on and put in place through compromise and respect for one another and the upcoming final year, which is uh, the 2020 school year. So it was a really great meeting. I think we were, we were very warmly received. And congratulations to Mr. B.J. Hall, who is the new president of the NAACP. So I look forward to working with him in the future. We will continue our um, quarterly meetings with leadership with the NAACP. We will continue our 
um, opportunities to go and speak to them about whatever topics might be of the most concern to them at that time. Um, it really was. It was, a, it was a great evening. And specifically, a shout out to Mr. Dale Farrell, who came and presented for all the initiatives that we're doing to recruit and retain. And Dr. Maureen Montgomery, who talked about all the different ways that our kids are finding um, personalized pathways through the school system. And she did get cut off at the end. We ran out of time, and she was most disappointed. So perhaps if you have the opportunity, she'll finish the, she'll finish the presentation <laughs> to anybody who I might like come forward. Time. Yes. Yes, it was, it, was a it was a really good night. And with that, um, it is happy holidays. We have Slack tomorrow. I can't wait. Um, all you kids, we used our first snow day. Yay! We only have three. <laughs> and it looks a little cold and snowy. So um, we will be judicious about those. I think ultimately it was the right call. Um, it's going to be it's going to be quite a winner. I just feel it's going to be quite a winner. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. The commission is now in public hearing. Public comment. We actually have one speaker, Gina Eschenbrenner. Yeah. Okay. Read my statement as you make your way up there. Let's see. We welcome public input on policies and issues affecting our schools. We take this time to listen and consider, but not to comment. This is not, however, the appropriate forum for negative comments or criticisms of individual staff or students. Concerns that cannot be resolved at the level closest to the situation should be directed to the superintendent. We will not permit comments criticizing individual staff or students since this is outside the scope of public comment. Additionally, the board sits as an appellate body in both student and employee appeals. We cannot comment or on or have prior knowledge of a case that would influence our ability to deliberate. To maintain the ability of the board to render a fair and unbiased decision, comments regarding individual student or personnel issues cannot be presented at public comment. Please sign in at the beginning of the meeting. Your public comment is limited to three minutes per speaker, and you may not yield your time to someone else. And if you have any written statements, please give them to Kathy, and she can um, send them out to all of us. There you go. As you know, my youngest child, my son, was one of 11 students that was blindsided in May with a non-continuance decision for the STEM program. In August, we sat down with administration and discussed the disappointing situation. They stood by their database decisions but agreed that communication could have been handled better. I want to acknowledge and publicly thank Dr. Montgomery for a follow-up phone call she made to me last month to check on my son and his transition from STEM to Esperanza. Her sincere interest in knowing how my son was doing meant very much to me as both a mother and as an SMCPS parent. I see on today's agenda that SMCPS will be presenting a PowerPoint overview of the Academy application process. After all the time and energy spent on analyzing the shortcomings of the previous application process, I was compelled to come here today to ensure everyone remembers what brought us to this point. As you all received the revised application criteria this morning, it is my hope that you will remember the following. Most current STEM 5 and STEM 8 students reapplying for middle and high school STEM have been in the program for years. SMCPS should already know whether or not these kids are a good fit. Current STEM students should get extra credit in the data matrix for previous success in the program. If they are meeting the requirements set forth in the Academy Handbook, then continuation in the program should be assured without the hassle of reapplying. Lack of transparency for the process persists as the revised criteria is shared online, but the weighting and math model of the criteria is seemingly unavailable. Given the fact that there were massive flaws in previously used math models, it would benefit everyone for any and all math models to be visible online. Most important is my last point. As stated in the superintendent's letter in the 2018 annual report focusing on the whole child, he says, and I quote, we know that success in school is more than a grade on a report card. It is understanding and managing emotions, setting and achieving positive goals, feeling and showing empathy for others, establishing and maintaining positive relationships, and finally making responsible decisions, end quote. I could not agree with this statement more. However, given the wording of the revised criteria for the STEM application process, I fear SMCPS is going down the same broken road we went down last year. Each STEM Academy application section states, and I quote, applicants are awarded an overall matrix score based on, upon the following criteria. In the event of a time matrix score, the team will consider, end quote, other items like student essays and teacher recommendations. This tells me that there will yet again be a data cut without consideration of the whole child and acknowledgement of the fact that these STEM students are more than grades and data matrix scores. <coughs> As such, I'm appealing to each one of you to please remember the following. STEM 5 and STEM 8 students in the 2018-19 STEM application pool were given zero credit, no extra points for prior success in the academy. This must change. The 11 students not selected for continuance and their families were blindsided by an administration that changed the measurement bar midstream by not adhering to their own academy handbook requirements. If SMCPS is prepared to again make strict data cuts as is currently advertised on the website, then I'm not sure what progress was made from the admitted mistakes in the last selection process. And frankly, that just makes me sad. 
sad for my son's gabby self-esteem that we are working on rebuilding and sad for the current elementary and middle school some students who are living in a culture of fear that was created by these past mistakes doomed to repeat if we don't make changes to this broken system thank you Have you read through your words? That's all. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Uh, consent agenda. I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And we will move to our first action item. Dr. Jaffers. Dr. Pantella. <laughs> I'm going to move this so that Ms. Meadows can see all 35 slides. In 10 minutes. Well, that's later. <laughs> that's <laughs> later on. I can't wait. That's later. <laughs> Dr. Montgomery wanted 75, but I talked her out of it. Oh, thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, well, good morning. Thank you uh, for your attention. You. Um, uh, Dr. Fancel and I will be presenting on um, Edgenuity Online uh, curriculum. Um, and uh, for us, what we actually uh, have done is um, uh, we were uh, involved with Apex, which is our online platform, uh, since 2010-2011 school year. Um, and uh, you know, over the years, uh, Paul has sort of overtaken. Um, that has been his, uh, his primary uh, point of contact for the system. Uh, we collectively felt, and he's, um, he's taking a lot of um, feedback from, from our users and stakeholders, that the online platform, in, in essence, wasn't meeting all of our needs especially those uh, our most challenged populations. A lot of it was text, uh, text heavy and wasn't a lot of um, other visual um, uh, enhancements, if you will. So we decided uh, we wanted to look at a uh, par product that was on the open market that was more cost effective and uh, more um, uh, in, a, in an improvement over what we have um, presently had. So I'm gonna pull, uh, uh, pull aside and, and let Paul take over here on the presentations. Uh, good morning, yes. Um, we looked at this as a reset because, as Dr. Jaffer said, you know, we felt that it was time to look at other vendors and see what was out there because over, you know, from 2010 to 2018 now, there was very little changes in Apex. They did come out with a new student portal this year, but the management component really has remained unchanged for the last seven years. And although we were not required to put together a committee to look at other vendors, we decided to go ahead and put together a selection committee uh, made up of school system uh, staff members. And this screen just goes uh, over uh, what our charge was as a committee. You know, we wanted to look at, first of all, the, the cost proposals that the vendors provided us, the curriculum, the platform itself, their training plan and what they would offer us in terms of training and then ongoing support to the school system. This, our committee was made up of a uh, varied group of individuals from central office and school-based representatives. So you can see we had central office, we had the office of technology, school-based members, both middle school and high school, uh, procurement um, to make sure that we were following the rules. And then also we've seen a growth in the use of um, online learning in home hospitals. So we also had a home <coughs> hospital teacher um, represent the committee also. This is our timeline. As we said, we uh, basically started uh, discussions in the summertime. And then I put together a timeline looking at uh, identifying the committee members. Um, initially narrowing down the vendor list because as we know, there are a lot of vendors out there. So we were able to narrow it down to three vendors. Then we had our vendor presentations to October and November. And then our goal was to have a selection and approval before January of uh, 2019. These were the three vendors that we decided upon, uh, Fuel Education, Edgenuity, and Inventum. And like I said, all three uh, vendors did uh, come here to St. Mary's County and presented to the committee. We used um, a very extensive evaluation criteria made up of 40 di 48 different elements. Uh, in curriculum, we had nine criteria, technology, 12 criteria, and the platform itself, 27 criteria. And looking at, uh, you know, how easy is it gonna be, you know, a lot of things that we looked at 
for things that we were struggling with Apex and using their platform. So we wanted to see how the different vendors handle those issues. And um, just, you know, under curriculum, you know, one of the biggest thing was the, the alignment to the, the common core, but also to the next gen standards also in science. And it's surprising that although, you know, a lot of the vendors were aware of the standards, not many of them have moved to the, the next gen standards. But um, I'm glad to say Ingenuity already had their course, science courses aligned to those standards. Uh, technology, we deferred to our uh, experts in that, so they, they basically evaluated all the criteria associated with technology. And then the rest of the members also um, looked at the platform itself and evaluated those criteria. The results of the evaluation had Ingenuity on top, Edmentum came in second, and Fuel Ed came in third as far as overall. Key features of Edgenuity, of course, you know, the, the biggest thing is looking, moving beyond just the text features and relying heavily on students having to read all the content. And you'll see in a little bit uh, how Edgenuity handles that. Um, we also wanted to make sure in our conversations, one thing we wanted to make sure we had access to was middle school curriculum. Because right now we don't have middle school curriculum with Apex because they wanted an additional fee just to, for us to be able to access that new curriculum because it did come out this previous school year. Um, again, focusing on world languages also. If you, um, we, we picked up uh, seven additional world languages going with Edgenuity. Uh, we picked up French three, German one, German two, Chinese one, Chinese two, Latin one, and Latin two. So um, quite an extensive uh, offering for the world languages. Um, we're probably not a typical user when it comes to online learning platform because we do a, a lot of customization. We take their core courses, we give all these scope and sequences to the supervisors, they look at it, they tell us you know, how the alignment is, we take their course and then we match it to our curriculum. So we take things away, we may move things in order or we may pull things in from different courses. And Ingenuity's platform and an ability to customize courses is so simple. You drop and drag, we, we, if you delete content, it deletes it from the assessment. Unlike with Apex, if you delete it, that, that those questions are still there. So it's a very powerful platform. And Paul's talking about 9th to 12th, here to 4th. That's what we've done in high school with, with Apex. We, we've had the ability to crosswalk. Here we have, um, we want to get into the 6 to, six to 8 realm and get more into the middle school accountability side. And, um, and as Paul will talk about, uh, for a better price, for a better product, we were able to, um, to go with uh, Edgenuity. At least that's, that's what the, um, uh, the matrix um, conveyed to us. So. Quickly looking at uh, the content library itself, um, our, our advanced placement, uh, they have 10 courses, original credit. They have 47 courses already approved by MSDE for original credit. Uh, credit recovery, I put 45 plus because what we do is based on the courses themselves, if we need a course that aligns to uh, one of the courses we have, we're able to uh, create that course uh, for students to use. They have uh, also CT 16 courses, uh, like the World Languages 12, and Test Prep 9. And working with some of our teachers already, as we piloted this program, we were able to align our 9 through 12 English they were able to create a um, part ELA 10 remediation course for students who were not successful the first time. So we've already designed that. We pushed it out to Great Mills High School, and there's already a lot of interest in the other high schools using that uh, course also. So the nice thing that we also looked at is, you know, what's their plan for future approval? Edgenuity is committed to working with MSDE to get additional courses approved for that original credit piece. So uh, that was a, a big plus for Ingenuity also. This slide here, which um, is built into three different slides. I'm just gonna bring it all up. Um, one thing that um, they've gone above and beyond also is with their courses, not only they looked at the Common Core, but then they looked at the Maryland alignment to the Common Core. So that last build right there is uh, several, almost all of their core content courses are already aligned to Maryland. And again, talking with an Algebra one teacher and an English teacher at the high school level, they felt, I mean, there was very little that had to be taken away from the course as far as alignment. So um, again, we're very pleased with that. One of the 
probably biggest features that uh, almost everyone was impressed by was the ability and Edgenuity's technique for delivering instruction. As you see right here, this is an, an introduction to a lesson, and up on that right-hand side, you actually have a teacher teaching the lesson to the students. So the students, and students cannot just click through the program. They have to watch the lesson, they have to go through the practice, and they got, then they move on to the quiz and the test. But we thought it was very powerful because the students we're targeting need that additional free teaching. And this program does that for us. So. And the last thing that uh, was one of the uh, priorities was you know, progress monitoring. Um, not only at the teacher level, the administrator level, but at the student and the family level. Um, like Apex, you can email out progress reports. But one thing we were also looking at is whether or not it had a parent portal, which Edgenuity does also. So parents are able to log in and see the progress of their students. They can't do the student's course, but they can just see how their students are doing on all their courses. So all in all, um, as I said, that the, the overwhelmingly the committee felt that Edgenuity was the product to go with uh, starting for the next school year. And, and I'll, I'll say as we, as we close out here, I think one of the big things for uh, Edgenuity is we had an opportunity also to reset. Uh, I think up to this point, people hear Apex and the connotation is somewhat negative. It's a, it's a remediation. Um, uh, but we have an opportunity here to reset what we do for our online platform. And teachers now can actually push in some of this Edgenuity content that's a lot more um, sort of supplemental. It's not necessarily remediation, but it can be supplemental to what the, the teacher normally does in the classroom. So. Um, I th and, you know, just from testimony working at Evening High School, since we're piloting this right now at Evening High School, and, you know, even some of the students have said, boy, I like this much better than Apex because of that teaching component. Now, some of them don't like it as much because they can't just click through the, the course, but we're holding them accountable, and that's what we want. We want students to be accountable for their learning. So we'd ask that the uh, Board of Education uh, approve this item, agenda item as presented. Okay, so um, just a couple questions. So is this program, is it going to take the place of APEX or is it going to complement it? Affirmatively, it will take, it, take its place. Okay, and um, what's the continuity like from, well, move, just moving from APEX to this program, I'm thinking of students who maybe don't like change. Is there any sort of continuity um, between the two programs, or are you just are you immediately implementing it, or is this going to be like a gradual process? You take that. Well, no. I mean, we are looking at full implementation uh, beginning uh, summer this school year, starting with our summer school recovery. You know, it's, uh, and you know, even working with the students at Evening High School, there's been very little concern on the student part from the transition, because on, I mean, online learning um, is online learning. They're gonna they're gonna see the curriculum. They're gonna work through the curriculum. They've got their quizzes, they, don't, they, don't, they have their tests. And one thing that we made sure we did as we transition students, and we'll continue to do this during the summer and even into the next school year, we're, we're giving credit to the students who've completed the work already. So if they've completed work in APEX, we go back into APEX, we pull the reports, we look at how much they've completed, we include an additional activity criteria, weighted criteria, that gives them credit for the grade that they already have. So, you know, there were some, a couple of students who already did work in APEX, am I gonna get credit for this? And they do. And they're, they're not finding any difficulty with the transition so far, moving from APEX to Ingenuity. It'll be a little bit more work on our part um, to, to cross swap, but yeah, we're definitely gonna, um, that, that'll be a challenge for us, but we, we can, uh, as Paul talked about, we're already, we're already working with us on the transition, uh, Ingenuity is, so. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Now, are all the students able to get into the different courses or do they have to be approved to take certain courses? The only, well, the schools control the majority of the placement of students into online learning. Uh, if it's a credit recovery course, it's a collaborative effort between the counselor, the student, the parent, the administration, and they decide those pieces for credit recovery. Now for original credit, we are kind of the key, the holders of the keys there. All original credit approvals have to uh, route through central office and through my office and then to Dr. Jaffers for final approval. So we want to make sure that we're not just 
we're, we're not placing students into original credit courses that are not approved by MSP. But, but I think what you're asking is localized, like if, if I just wanted to use the program in right. the classroom. And I think that's, that's, the, um, that's what we're going to do. That's what we didn't necessarily do for APEX. We had reserved that as a remediation, but we're actually going to move towards the more supplemental side of the online platform. So, okay. so, so we are working towards that. that, that that's very, very important to us. Sure. Okay, because I know that in the past, like I asked how many students were actually taken advantage of the APEX using as to supplement what they were doing. And, you know, it kind of varied really by year to year. Um, so I'm hoping that there's more students that are going to find this appealing and to be able to use it as, as a supplement. Um, during this time, did you have any group of students or schools that piloted the different programs that you were looking at to say what they liked, what they didn't, I mean, just gave them like a, a simple course or just to kind of go on there and um, besides the, uh, the committee that you had chosen? No, we did not have any students uh, pilot the program. We relied on the educators. And, and a lot on the staff that's doing the online learning at the schools already. Okay. And then, um, does this work in the same way as APEX did where you have, let's say, a math teacher or English teacher and they review the student's course as they're going through and they have the ability to open up the next section? Like, you could only get so far without the teacher looking at it? Uh, the, the way the, uh, the platform works, um, even with APEX, was that students can work through lessons and quizzes. When they get to a quiz, they have two opportunities to pass a quiz before a teacher has to interact with the, the grade book to unlock it for the last opportunity for that student to take the quiz. So, you know, and you were also talking about the supplemental piece. One thing nice about this program is it also has the ability for a teacher to, to put in keywords and it brings up all the lessons associated with that keyword, and they can de design a mini lesson, which our goal is, you know, we, our goal is to remediate before students fail, to get away from that quarter recovery, get away from credit recovery, but, all, but for having teachers use it for supplemental in the classroom and allowing students to go in and do just a unit or a, or a piece of a unit based on the, uh, the items that they were not successful in in the classroom. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, the only question I have is on evaluation criteria. I noticed there was not, no um, item here for cost. We uh, did, we, we, we looked at cost. Um, I will say that, you know, the cost factor wise, you know, you saw the price for Ingenuity, 190,000. Uh, the next closest was 100,000 more. And the next vendor was a half a million. So um, just shy of a half a million for the year. So economics had it had a, some type of measure in how you see okay. it. That's good to hear. I think. Yes, we had to, <laughs> that's all, we had that's to consider that. that. <laughs> Is that all you have? Um, I just have two comments. Number one, I think it's a great idea to open it up to the middle school. Um, I think some of the feedback from the parents has been moved <laughs> to the standard-based reporting. The kids aren't maybe quite as cognizant of what their grades are in the class, you know, the A, B, C, D. So when they hit middle school, all of a sudden they are. So now it's that checking the pack and, you know, seeing where they are. Um, and I, so I think that's, that will probably be beneficial as, you know, we move away from grades in elementary school, but then all of a sudden you're hit with it when you hit middle school. Uh, my second comment is kind of piggybacking on Mrs. Weaver's about the, um, the use of it for targeted students in high school. I think, um, I mean, I can think of a couple instances, you know, if a child's failing or has problems in a class and falls below that 2-0 in that class, you know, in the midpoint of a semester, you know, they don't necessarily need it for the whole course, mm -hmm. but maybe just like a unit in geometry or calculus or something, I think that would be beneficial, mm -hmm. you know. So I think, I think that's a, you know, a, a good resource for them too. So thank you very much. We, we have a pretty extensive uh, professional development plan with Edgenuity also, so we're going to be addressing that as we build in 12 days per school year, mm -hmm. or 12, yeah, 12 days of uh, professional development, and that's what we want to hit on also, is getting to the classrooms more. 
Well, I mean, and now with one lunch in the high school, I mean, I know, I know if, the, if a kid's having a problem, a student, sorry, ha is having a, you know, a problem in a class, you know, they can go to that classroom or that study group during one lunch. But even now to have something like this available during that time period in order for them to get that grade above that, you know, that, that mark, I think is a, a, a good use of it. So. I think you made a good choice, uh, recommendation, I'll say that. Um, because um, we had the um, other program in 2010, 2011, and it was time to relook it because things change as some companies keep up and some companies do not keep up. And we want the best online learning platform for our students. I like the way that uh, it's going to be used for home and hospital uh, for the middle school. And will it be available for the Fair Lead Academy? Yes. Okay. Uh, and when will this? come online if approved today? Uh, full implementation would begin with our summer school program this year. Okay. And that gives us, you know, the next four months to sequence all our courses. But you're currently using it in evening high school as well. Where else are we piloting it right now? We are piloting at Eaton High School, uh, fairly two for the IAC program, and we have three home hospital teachers using it. Very good. Um, thank you very much, and I like the idea that they are interested and they will work with MSDE so that we are up to date on everything, uh, that the students just can't speed through the program, that they have to listen to an instructor, and it provides the customization that, that we so desperately need. And um, you did a great job. You evaluated it on 48 criteria which was very good. Thank you for your hard work and everyone who worked with you on bringing this forward to the Board of Education to keep us up to date on what is needed for our students to accelerate achievement and learning. Thank you. Helpful that they're willing to work with MSDE since MSDE complains that they've lost <laughs> people within that department and therefore they've been lagging in being able to approve additional courses for online learning. Um, I also like the fact that um, that this appears to be site licensed rather than per pupil. Correct. Um, so that also means that we'll be able to allow many more students to have access to this. Um, I noticed it, it appears that um, we will not be using whatever the Sophia, um, it, it, in looking at the um, invoice, there's a comment um, if this quote includes any Sophia Learning Incorporated courses for purchase. Yeah, I mean, um, Ingenuity owns um, several different products. The reason I ask is it notes that um, use of that course is prohibited for all students under the age of 13 years. <laughs> I wondered why. Um, I mean, it might be. Sure, with the program, we didn't we didn't look at that program. Well. Thank you for that. Perhaps, <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, I mean, they're very specific about that. So um, I, it just had me wondering um, what the heck Sophia was. Um, thank you for exploring other opportunities. Um, and uh, you know, I, I look forward to hearing from students how they like this and um, more importantly, whether or not it, it improves their rate of success in their learning. Thanks very much. Anything else? That's all. Okay. Mm -hmm. May I have a motion for this recommended action item? I move that the Board of Education approve the contract with Ingenuity Online Curriculum for online curriculum licenses from December 31st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019 at a cost of $20,750 and further authorizes the use of the contract for fiscal year 2020 through from July the 1st, 2019 through June 30, 2020 with the option for four one-year renewals at a total cost of $190,400. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion carried. Thank you very much. <coughs> Next is the Capital Improvements Program for 
So it looks like Sophia courses are for college credit. Ah. <laughs> the internet, let me tell you. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. I'm a little under the weather, so I apologize for my voice in the beginning. <laughs> um, it's that time of year. <laughs> Don't talk loud, we can hear you. Mm. <laughs> um, we have been before you a couple of times in the recent months talking about the capital improvements program um, and this culminates that approval process with the approval of the local capital improvements program um, we've heard a little bit from the commissioners about where they're headed through a work session we just had recently and we did have a little bit of discussion with them yesterday about this as well um, what I want to talk about a little bit is the state CIP um, as we've talked about this um, in the past couple of months, it's, it's a little bit volatile um, and the changes that are coming and new regulations and we're doing our very best to work with the state and to adapt. Um, but as we look forward to the local CIP, it is impacted a little bit um, in part by the things that are happening at the state. Um, for this year, we did reduce um, from 58% um, percent to 57% percent, um, participation. In the future, it's gonna be evaluated every two years and we are definitely headed towards 50%. Um, I think that is a, a definite um, place we will head and um, over next time I anticipate that we'll be at least at 56 or 55 percent at the next round. The state did increase the state cost um, per square foot by five percent. Um, that was really offsetted. Um, they, they came out after they made their initial um, increase um, and they had realized that in part of the legislation we, we lost the state contingency portion of our projects was two and a half percent. So they did increase the um, state construction cost by 5% to account for that loss. Um, what this means is that change orders are all locally funded at this point. Um, so while that does not, um, we don't benefit from new construction districts, we don't have any projects, we did see a, a loss of those state contingency funds which had to be converted over to the local dollars. Um, the building costs which are used for new construction or renovations um, did increase. The projects we have are HVACs and systemic renovations and the way that's calculated is we look at our internal budgets we use what our past history has done we talk to our neighboring counties to see what they're experiencing and we have to be within a certain realm with the state they want to make sure that we're comparable to other projects of the same type but because they're so unique that we do get to work with them on specific um, costs for those budgets I think one of the key pieces is the last bullet um, state funding is going to be based on our three-year average um, and this year the state determined that to be 4.6 million and the, the piece of that that is um, challenging for us is we can never go up we can only go down um, so if we don't have projects that come in and we can't consistently get that 4.6 million because of the way that the project budgets work um, there is a conceivable probable um, likelihood that the cost could go down that they will participate in um, and trying to keep that 4.6 million is something that we are working on desperately as we look at the projected numbers um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that might work uh, some years we may have to underestimate where we're overestimating because we know projects are going to be deferred at the state level um, and this slide kind of demonstrates that we had um, requests in um, for six projects this year um, the state will be acting tomorrow on their 75 percent recommendation which will be for fully funding the first five of those projects um, the way we get to that number that we have the 7.6 um, is we, we look at all of our requests um, the total state um, eligible funding this year is 4.6 million um, we had a windfall which will not happen again because they don't pay for contingency projects anymore but when we had a project that had a contingency if we didn't use all of that it was held in reserve for us so uh, we had hundred and four thousand six hundred dollars in contingency from prior projects that we were able to apply to this year <coughs> which um, will get us all five projects approved but that hundred and four we will not have that in the future once all of the contingency funds are exhausted on all of our projects um, so what we were able to do is we were able to work within our budgets and to make some adjustments and fully fund the first five what that leaves us with is a two point almost nine million dollar shortfall um, which would be the total for the diner group and HVAC project um, we will be rolling that it will be a deferred project we will roll that in in the future we've left it in the CIP request at the state and what we've told them is if future funding is to come available this year um, we would like consideration for that project to be funded um, 
we will see how that goes. There was some information put out yesterday that the governor may be seeking additional funds. Um, so we'll see how that continues to play out. As I said, they'll be acting um, tomorrow on the 75%. Um, they When they did this year, the 75, they also gave the 100% recommendation, which is how we came to the first five being fully funded. Um, one of the main reasons that we are not appealing diners at this time, because we always appeal to projects. Um, if we were and they were to come up with three or four hundred thousand dollars on that project that locks us into the budget this year and then knowing that we wouldn't be able to start the project for probably two years by the time we collected all the money we would be dealing in today's dollars and we don't want to do that what we're working very hard to do is make sure that we are asking for the construction funding the year that we're going to use it um, and what that means is that the county will be forward funding the design so we can get to that point that we're ready to roll we're currently experiencing that with Park Hall in Hollywood um, the climate has changed um, dramatically. Uh, at the time they were approved, they were in the $104 to $108 per square foot range, and that costs now up to $132 a square foot. And we're going to have to, to, to work. Mr. Hartwick is working diligently to make sure that we have projects that can go forward. Um, so on the local capital improvement side, um, at the end of last um, session for the local CIP, we did have a discussion with the commissioners, and based on where our current enrollment is, um, and where the trends are projecting of a slowdown um, of growth. Um, we did remove all of the capacity projects, which was the elementary school and a small addition to Letty Marshall Dent um, and the secondary capacity project. Dent is still in as a modernization, but we did remove that small addition. Um, to accommodate that, what we wanted to do is we had in a secondary capacity study. Um, we've now expanded that request to be for K to 12 to look at how we're going to address our needs, because we do have needs um, with the changes at the state level and knowing that enrollment is slowing down. So we want to do a study to look at how we can address with the existing facilities that we have, the money that we know we're probably capable of getting, how can we address the capacity in the future long term. Um, we did make um, funding available as we eliminated the um, projects that had capacity from our CIP. It did leave us with some additional funding that we went back and I worked closely with Mr. Wynn, our Director of Maintenance, and we looked at projects that had been deferred for HVAC and systemic renovations. We looked at um, his deferred maintenance for smaller projects, which would fall into the critical and programmatic categories, and we did include those. Um, we feel it's the time that we really need to be working on this infrastructure <coughs> that was put into place in the 1990s that is coming due. Um, and in doing that, we, were, we took what was a five-year deferral down to about two years with the projects that we placed in here. So it brings us closer to where we need to be. You're going to see pre-design studies um, in, in the um, process. So the first year, we would get a pre-design study. We'd bring the engineers in um, to look at these HVACs and routes and try and give us an idea of where we need to be. Um, and then that would allow us to go into a year of design funding, which would be locally funded. At the end of that year, the, the design would be done. We would have cost estimates for the projects. We would then ask for state approval of the project for construction, allowing us to start that summer. Um, and it allows us to stay on track with the dollars that would be being budgeted in terms of the construction time frame. Um, so the local CIP list is before you. Um, with everything that we've done, um, and you'll notice one large item in there is the security funding that we talked about last year. Um, so that added um, $8.8 .8 million to the local CIP. So given all the changes that we made in bringing all the projects forward, um, incorporating safety and security, all of the deferred maintenance, um, over the five years we're still giving back $766,000 less than when we came in this time last year. So we were able to meet our needs um, and to structure projects accordingly. Uh, you will notice that they are spaced out a little differently, and that is to coincide with the fact that we have to meet that 4.6 million um, threshold. So they are timed and staggered. Um, the deferral of Dinard, if not approved this year, um, I've already accounted for that. It'll mean more locally next year, but I've left the, the amount at the state. We're only asking for 2.8 <coughs> next year. So if we bring the additional 2.8 in for Dinard, we'll be right there where we need to be in the $4.6 million range. So the CIP list, as we've talked about, we have the continuation of Park Hall in Hollywood, um, Green Holly, Great Mills, um, Partial Roof, Green Holly Switchgear and HVAC, and the state relocatable for Park Hall would be our state request and looks like it is going to go forward. 
um, Dinard, um, I would propose that if deferred, we still leave the design funding in for the project so that we can continue on and we know where we are. Um, we have our relocatables um, for meeting our short-term needs. And there's the first mechanic seal modernization is the first time we see the, the, the pre-design study coming in, which allows us to come in and look at um, it from an engineering standpoint to make sure we're on track with the project scope. Our 1.3, um, almost 1.4 million in safety and security in FY20 and followed in FY2021 by the 6.5. And then our building infrastructure, critical and programmatic. Um, you'll see some big changes in there. We really went back and we looked and we prioritized and we've got chillers um, that we've added and we've got some additional paving and other projects in there um, to really try and meet the needs of where we need to be in the deferred maintenance. Um, and then going into 2021, which would be our next request, you'll see the, the design for mechanics still over two years and then construction in 2023. Town Creek's HVAC pre-design Lenny Marshall Dent's modernization pre-design, the other section of the Great Mills High School roof. Um, that is a pre-design study as well. And then you'll notice the school capacity study K to 12. So for the next two years, we're really gonna focus on trying to get caught up on some of the deferred maintenance and start pre-designing some of our facilities. Um, those critical projects that we talked about and programmatic, um, these are outlined for you in FY 2020. We'd be looking at Banneker's Well and Pump Controls, Leonard High School Stadium Lights, and High School Stadium Sound um, at all three schools. And in 2020 for programmatic, we would have Esperanza and Town Creek's paving, the completion of the playground funding, um, and flooring at Green Holly. The FCI study is something that we do have money programmed in. That's the facility condition index that we've been talking about. Mr. Gural has to have that completed by June of this year. They do have an RFP out um, to do that. The reality is that we, as most LEAs, do not have the data that the consultants are going to need. So we are looking ahead um, to how we may need to have funds in next fiscal year to account for the study not being able to be completed this year. I think in some form they will give some kind of a report, but to do it to the fidelity that it needs to be done, I know most LEAs are lacking the data that will be needed to be provided to have that done by June of this year. And then we have um, PA systems that you will notice that are programmed in. Um, those are infrastructure pieces that we really need to, to be moderniz modernizing as we go forward. We're working on a prototype now as to what that would look like and then we'll have funding for that on a regular basis. I think the thing to notice is when we start looking at some of these paving projects, um, we have Esperanza, we have Chapticon, um, we have Park Hall and Banneker. These are all really large sites, so they are considerably um, an expense, um, and I, we really appreciate the willingness of the county to work with us on this, because in the past, when we're getting $75,000 every two years to do Chapticon High School, it would have taken multiple cycles to try and do that, so we're very appreciative of this funding source. So the recommendation would be for the Board of Education to approve the agenda item as presented. Um, if approved today, um, the local capital improvements program would be submitted to the board of uh, or to the county commissioners on January 4th um, and then there's a series of work sessions with the county and the XMT group um, as we start to go through this process that will continue on through the spring for approval I have no questions for you today thank you for your presentation though you were extremely thorough so thank you well, Ms. Howe, I know that you are always on top of things. Um, you, you can project out what needs to be done, the maintenance, when things need to be repaired, replaced, et cetera. You are really good <coughs> at, at doing that. And I guess I have a problem with how the state has decided to do the funding, and I know that that's probably going to be an ongoing discussion. But because you've done a good job you know, predicting things, um, and our maintenance department and you know has done a great job upkeeping our buildings and you know we've been good stewards of the of the money as long as with all the staff um, basically it's has not worked in our favor now because we are only getting 4.6 million because that's the average of the last three years if we would have like our buildings would be crumbling and you know we're not keeping things up to par we, we'd be eligible for 
I don't know, what, 20 million, you know, because I don't know what the other systems are asking, but, you know, I, you know, our system really prides itself in how well we have kept up our buildings, but now it seems like we're being penalized for doing that. We are, and, and I... And I think Mrs. Allen and others have shared this. I have some real concerns with the facility condition index. Um, we're going to come out looking really, really good because we do use our funds that we get to make sure we're making a huge impact on our facilities. And others, you know, other counties for whatever reason may not find themselves in the same level we are with the facility condition index. But I really do think that that is going to drive where the funds go. Um, We've talked a lot about this, you know, we talk about grades because that's a lot of what we are. And, and I think we're, we're an A, a plus school system in terms of our school construction, others aren't. And it feels like the whole idea is to get back to an average of, you know, kind of like a C is kind of where we've talked about it is, we're gonna take the ones that have been doing really well and we're gonna slow that down and we're gonna start aging that a little. And we're gonna take the ones that, that need to be probably definitely done and bring them up. Um, but they're not gonna probably get to the level still where we are. <coughs> Mr. Gorell has some very definitive ideas of how things work in the Midwest. He's trying to apply that here. It doesn't necessarily work with where we've been, especially through the 1990s and early 2000s where we did a lot of construction across the state and we, we made really good facilities. Um, he is not a proponent of funding HVAC and systemics and when pushed on that, he, he will back down. But I know in the back of his mind, it's still not where he wants to be and that is what we need. So I am very guardedly cautious about what the future looks for us. Um, I know 4.6 million is not gonna go up unless something changes, it's gonna only go down. But we are gonna do everything we can to put ourselves in the position to keep the 4.6. Thank you very much. My, my question is about the 4.6. So I know that, that it's always an appeal process. So what what is the what is the process, if anything, to have them reevaluate or look at what the 4.6? Because I mean, my comments were basically the same as Mrs. Weaver's. You know, I mean, we, Baltimore County can't put air conditioning in their schools, but yet, you know, so whatever money they've been given the past four years in order to do that is pushing their average up, whereas ours is not, so. So this, there was a facility planner meeting um, held last week, um, and Mary Hayden from my office wound up going to that. I was not able to attend. Um, and this was brought up by an LEA. It was mm -hmm. point blank asked, um, and it was basically, this is the formula. If you don't like it, you can appeal it, but this is the formula. Um, we have great needs, and this is how we are addressing the great needs across the, the state. But, I mean, um, who, but who decides the appeal? Is it just is it just Mr. Burrell, or is it? It is the IAC, okay. which he is the chairperson. Yeah, 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 okay. um, so we, we've all been challenging. Um, that, that facility planner meeting was quite interesting, and I gather that as a result of, of some of the discussion, um, at a break, a whole bunch of the LEAs chose not to come back because it got confrontational. Um, I, I understand his method of saying that there should be a facility condition and we should, should use that. I think it should be used to determine what the needs need to be in terms of funding across all the school system. And if it should be used to help generate additional funding um, and need for that funding and justification for the funding. It should not be a penalty for a school system that has done a good job. Okay. And that's what we keep advocating <coughs> so for. Here's my last question and then. Um, so with the new, whatever this new audit body is that's going to, uh, from the state, that's going to audit school system funding and use of funds, was that discussed in there as well? Because let's say that we did have an LEA that did receive funding for state construction, but yet they might not have used it in the way that they were supposed to. So does that have an impact on any of this in any of the meetings that you've been in or uh, that we wasn't even? understand, no, because we've asked the question um, and, and it, it's a difficult because we're going up against our, our counterparts and right. we're, we're trying to be very respectful, but at the end of the day, there are several counties that have received a ton of money and if you look at any IAC agenda meeting, you will see them returning it because of their inability to move that funding forward, which tied up those funds and no one got to use them. Right. And they will be reallocated right back to those same counties. So it is a, a point that we keep trying to drive home is give it to those counties that can move the projects forward and make a difference today. Okay, all right, thank you. Sorry, I mean, you kind of jumped in green, but go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm used to that. <laughs> well, you get to go first next time. <laughs> um, I'm looking at the numbers. Uh, you know, you're losing your contingency. Um, the other thing that we talked about a little bit is future costs. 
uh, as I understand it, uh, the cost of construction is going up measurably. Co you know, interest rates are going up, so on and so forth. So the one question I have, do you have escalators uh, and your projected costs for the next three, four years? And if, what are those escalators in terms of percent? So in terms of the state and the local, we can only put in our budgets on current dollars. So everything that you see is bur built in on current dollars. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I do my cash flow, I look at that in the future. So as I'm starting to stack up projects, I know that today's dollars are not going to equate to what it's going to be three years from now. So when I try and, and slot the projects in, I try and look, and right now we're, we're averaging a 3 to 5% increase. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to make sure that as we do this, we can make sure that as they go up, um, we still have room to slot them. Because if not, what's going to happen is we're going to just start deferring projects every year. So we have staggered them in a way that we should be able to keep going forward. With that said, it's going to count heavily on the county to help us do that because the 4.6 isn't going to change even though the costs are going to go up 3 to 5% every year. Is and we're going to lose percentages at the state at the same time. One of the um, things maybe addressed to Dr. Walker is value engineering. Uh, <clears throat> often uh, you get cut on, on funding and you can, uh, um, an architect can take, uh, without changing the major scope of, of the project, be able to do value engineering, which by definition is uh, you're doing the same value for less money. Right. Instead of having, uh, you know, a two by four uh, lights or something like that, you could come up with something cheaper that could still put out the foot candles. And um, it just seems to me, uh, based on the meeting we had yesterday with the county commissioners, uh, we, we got our work cut, cut out for us in terms of being able to find, you know, the, the, the necessary funds. Um, granted, they gave us uh, a cost per square foot increase of 5%, is that right? Yes, but that's on new construction. That's in construction. So HVAC, new and, construction. New construction. HVAC and roofs um, are based on budgets, estimates that right. we provide, and they have to be within the realm of what other counties are doing across the state per square foot for that roof or HVAC. Um, and that's where we're really trying to focus. And the value engineering, you know, that's something that Mr. Hartwick is already doing. He's looking at all options that, that we have, especially for Park Hall and Hollywood. Um, but that is the reason that we're going to go to a pre-design first, then design, then construction. When we, we know that we have looked at all the options, that pre-design is really going to get us in, and we're going to do our core samples. We're going to look at how the systems are functioning and really target it so that we, one, pick the right designers to come back and work on it. But two, they know into going in really early on in the design what we're looking at in terms of the, the condition of that facility and what we need to address. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, based on your presentation, we have some increasing challenges. We're facing our state cost share reduction, the loss of the contingency, and the funding based on the three-year average. That's tough. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a challenge. <clears throat> it's going to be challenging times, but we have always pulled through and gone ahead and moved forward with whatever's presented to us. So hopefully the picture may look brighter with comments coming uh, to the new person that is in charge. Then maybe some of these things might be changed. We're hopeful. That's what we're pushing we're for. We're hopeful. So I remain hopeful. Thank you for your presentation. You gave us a lot of information and a lot of background information. Um, and the, what's in store for us in the future? Right. And, and Ms. Washington, you're, you're on it um, almost perfectly. Everybody's trying. All the LEAs are working, trying to, to get the message out. Um, Maeve and Mako have been engaged. They're advocating for us as well. Um, and really what it's going to take, I mean, what, what we're talking about is a piece of legislation that was approved last year. And I think there were some pieces in there that really had the right intention and we're, we're going to get us in place, but we're also faced with some portions of that that are very challenging. So um, it will take legislation to change some of where we're at right now, but I think everyone is trying to advocate for that and get the word out. So hopefully we will have change in the future. Thank you. I think, you know, we keep talking about the fact that um, we have worked so hard to be where we are with our buildings um, and, and with this facilities um, condition index. Uh, 
the tax dollars that the citizens of St. Mary's County are sending forward to the state mm -hmm. are not going to be coming back here. And I, I think that's what's sort of really bothering me that um, previously uh, the construction dollars were allocated uh, based on need across the state given what each school system felt was appropriate. Um, so local decisions where I think they should be. Um, you know, Mr. Gorell came and presented to the Legislative Committee at MABE, and I was there. Um, I was struck by a lot of what he said, especially that um, he currently is a, a small department. He wants to grow that department very significantly. Um, you know, I don't, I don't agree with that approach um, because he's trying to take it away from locals, and I, you know, MABE is very much a proponent of local control and the importance of that, of making decisions closest to where they have the impact. Um, I would rather maintain our buildings and, um, and address systems appropriately than I would have to deal with the additional cost of repairing things as they break down, the discomfort that um, students and staff feel, um, that that's just not the way to go. And with respect to value engineering, I know it has a place, but I think we also have to be cautious and look at the roof at Hollywood Elementary that was value engineered um, and didn't last the length of time that our other roofs are lasting. So um, it costs us less money up front, but in the long run, we're spending a lot more based on the maintenance that has to happen there. Um, and so one of the things that I've seen from and heard from Mr. Gorell is he's not really interested in factoring in um, what it's going to cost to maintain these buildings or the, the changes that he's advocating. You know, when, you, when you use um, sheetrock rather than, um, than block construction, um, those buildings fall apart really fast. Well, his, his fundamental, we have a fundamental difference of opinion, he and I yeah. do. Um, because in, in early on in the discussions, we were talking about some of our schools and we we're talking about modernizations, um, Mechanicsville in, in particular. And his is like, well, why don't you just tear it down and build new? Because he believes in new construction, because new construction can be built with sheetrock and others cheaper than if we can modernize it. Um, mine is, we have a long history of our facilities lasting us for a very long time. The, the amount of money that was put into that initially that has been put in to maintain it um, is worth something. There's a value in that. There's also a value in the fact that that is a, a community school. It's they're all beloved by the, the families that go there, um, and there is no reason to tear down Mechanicsville at this point and to build something new. Um, the challenges with that are great. Uh, where do you put the students during that period of time? Is there enough land? Um, and if we can modernize it for a fraction of that cost, why wouldn't we? So he and I have had a fundamental um, difference of opinion on modernization of a facility versus new construction. Another dynamic is is uh, lease purchase. You know, the building next door, uh, I think, was a real win-win for for the school system. They were able to rent a long-term lease instead of spending a lot of capital funds for, for a new building. So that, that's a dynamic too that you, I'm sure, you will have considered. Yes, it has been on the on the discussion docket for us. Yes. Okay. Thanks very much. May I have a motion? I move <coughs> that the Board of Education approve the fiscal 2020 through fiscal year 2025 local <coughs> capital improvements program for submission to the commissioners of St. Mary's County. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Elementary standards based instruction and reporting. Ms. <coughs> Ramsey and Ms. Alex. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for allowing us to join you today. We're here to present an update on standards based instruction and reporting. We'd like to acknowledge the support we've received from Dr. Smith, Dr. Montgomery, Dr. Marr, Ms. Bachner, Ms. Loker, Ms. Dvorak, Ms. Contugno, and other central office members. Their time and effort have been critical to the success of this initiative. 
In 2015, St. Mary's County Public Schools decided to go to standards-based instruction and reporting to increase the instructional focus on learning standards while also improving the specific feedback to students and families in regards to their child's progress. With our traditional report card, a student receives one letter grade per content areas. Teachers can also choose a comment from a menu to provide additional information. One of the two components of our new report card indicate the level of command a student has demonstrated on an end of the year goal. The second component of the report card is a student specific narrative. Although they differ from school to school, the critical components are consistent countywide, including student strength, areas of growth, reading level, and other appropriate data in parent friendly terms. The timeline for our transition began in 2015, and this year, the standards-based report card format that has been used in the primary grades was also implemented in third grade. In the next two years, we'll continue to roll it up to fourth and fifth grade with this group of students. <coughs> Communication and professional development is occurring at the school and county level. Each elementary school has a school-based team that meets regularly to debrief from county work sessions, address school-specific needs, and to plan for informational and feedback opportunities. They also plan professional development and collaborative opportunities at the school level. <coughs> at the county level, we've been working with primary and third grade teachers during the transition. As a group, we've worked with the curriculum, grading tools, and communication practices that will best support standards-based instruction and reporting. This year, we also brought in a group of fourth grade teachers from each elementary school and followed a similar model of work sessions to prepare them for the change next year. Sharing information with our families and educators continues to be a critical component of our transition. We've utilized our website, a standards-based report card brochure, school-based newsletters, parent information nights to ensure that our communities are aware and knowledgeable about this change. Teachers can access resources not only through the elementary curriculum site, but also through a specific standards-based report card site. We've utilized surveys to gather feedback, allowing us to make adjustments throughout the implementation process. Our website includes specific information, a newly created video, a parent survey. This allows for two-way communication and easy access for families to reference. A few adjustments were made over the summer based on stakeholder feedback. This included the removal of distinguished command and an opportunity for all third grade teachers to have formal collaborative and work session time with their teams. Where we are now. This past <laughs> month, our third grade families received their standards-based report cards. While we're seeking feedback through surveys, there has been very few questions in regard to the report card format. We feel like this is due to our communication through the transition, as well as the clear alignment to their second grade report cards. <coughs> We're continuing to monitor through stakeholder feedback and surveys. This November, a survey was shared with both teachers and principals. Based on the third grade teacher survey, 72% of our teachers felt like the new grading system provides an accurate picture of student progress. Fifty-five percent of the third grade teachers reported that they received no parent feedback about the report cards. Twenty-six percent reported being able to answer the few questions that they had received. The remaining 19 percent of the third grade teachers indicated that parents expressed individual feedback that included concerns such as the transition to middle school, the range of partial command, and no honor roll recognition. 
teachers noted um, that our brochure, the parent conferences, and report card narratives all aided in the clarification of these questions. We will, however, take all the feedback from and concerns to the committee to see if there are adjustments, adjustments that we need to make. We'll also use the feedback to plan for the system, for example, sharing ideas of how schools are going to recognize our students using this new system. 97% of the teachers felt moderately or very supported during this process, and we will continue to provide support by offering professional development and budgeting for collaborative planning so teams can plan together. Dr. Smith and Dr. Montgomery have met with teachers focus groups and attended committee meetings. Content supervisors have also been fully involved in each step of the process, hearing feedback and providing resources to teachers. A survey of elementary school principals also indicated that when parent questions have come up, principals are able to provide information or clarify misconceptions easily. Our principals have been an instrumental in making this initiative work. They serve on the committee, they work together during leveled meetings and at ANS meetings. They support each other with ideas to address concerns and proactively plan for our next steps. Looking forward, we continue to follow our implementation plan and make adjustments based on feedback and the needs of our community. Standards-based instruction and reporting is what's best for kids and our community. At this time, we're happy to answer any questions or hear any comments. Okay, Jim gets to go first. Jim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> um, in, in looking at uh, all these graphs, it appears to me that m more than 50% of the time the parents are not responding. Is that, mm -hmm. now, is that good or bad? <laughs> the fact that they're not responding, you know, I was thinking that's bad, then I got to thinking maybe that's good. Well, it, we always think the same thing, but we're, we're available. We make our resources available. If we have parent nights, we have principal roundtable discussions, I feel like we're making ourselves available for comments. So I'm thinking it's a good thing. You know, they're, they're meeting with teachers. Teachers are able to answer the questions mm -hmm. and, you know, be able to talk with confidence about why this is what's best for their specific child. Right. So I really do feel like the first report card's out that if people were really concerned, we would hear more concerns. Right. That's a good. good question. You don't know. That's all I have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I had no questions, so we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So going off of Jim's question, <laughs> um, I look at it as if you've done this since kindergarten or first grade, these parents are pretty well down. used to what is going mm -hmm. on. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't think you, as you keep rolling out to new grades, I think there would be less and less questions. Since you are now going to be looking at fourth grade next year, how, how is it received by the teachers and staff in, in fourth grade when you bring them in for that first time for um, this is what you're going to be doing next year? We want to be ahead of the curve. You know, we, we open it up to anyone that wants to, um, you know, start, uh, start and be part of the conversation. But I really think we've got such a wonderful group of teachers that rather than be told next year what they're going to be doing, they want to be part of the conversation. So um, third grade, I think, was the biggest transition because it's new to intermediate, but we really haven't gotten a lot of pushback from fourth grade teachers. We, we have people really wanting to be involved in the conversation. That's, that's good to hear. Um, now, what about students that are, are transferring in, especially the military, or even if it's the middle of the year, and they are coming from a school system that has grades. How are you working with that? Are you, you know? Same parent presentation we've been giving, okay. you know, because I really do think that um, we're giving them the, the rationale, the research, and our timeline, and really that same conversation. 
And I think Audrey and I both have a community of military families, and a lot of them are coming in with standards-based report cards. Okay. There's yeah. other states doing it. There's other counties doing it. And my message to parents is also when we look at that, it's so much more information for us to place their student appropriately rather than a B in reading. So um, I think that everybody is either aware of the transition or you know, are, we've been able to communicate the importance of it. Okay, and what about, have you received any feedback from any school systems when you are, when a, a child is moving? And they are taking, you know, our report and it's now going to a system that does not use this. I have not. I haven't heard any principals mm -hmm. share that type of experience. Mm -mm. Yeah, that would be interesting to hear, mm -hmm. you know, how they view our, our mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. There really are so many counties moving and states moving to a standards-based system that I don't think it's um, terribly unusual for students to see one or the other as they're moving to different places. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, I, was, I have two, a couple comments. Um, I was a little disappointed on the survey respondents. There's only 32 teachers that responded and only 13 principals. So, and 32 third grade teachers. There are 32 third, third, grade, yeah, teachers. Sure. third yeah. grade teachers. So, but I mean, that's, I mean, it was a pretty big change. Well, we also, that's just, there are 18 elementary right, principals. 18 elementary one of them is already yeah, on seven, the committee. So the okay. seven, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Plus, I was thinking, you know, 18 schools, if there's an average of two. Uh, I was two thinking about 60. I tried grades. to do the math. The small right. schools have two. At right, the large ones have four. Right, so I was thinking between 60 and 64. I didn't get the exact number, but that's okay. what I'm thinking, third grade. Right, well, that, that, that's kind of what I came up with, yeah. too. So Great. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, and then to Ms. Weaver's point, I think, um, so as my children have gone through elementary school, mm -hmm. there's always, you know, and all the elementary schools are some of, you know, they're somewhat clustered together so the kids are in between. So you always see the difference between what's being taught at this school mm -hmm. versus what's being taught at this school. Yeah. So, and you know, where they are during the course of the school year. So I think with the standards-based report card, it's making the teachers almost be better, <laughs> like across yeah. the board, because if you pull a standard down to put in second grade where you're supposed to master your math facts, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> or third grade multiplication, let's go with that. You also sequence it out by quarter, right. so, then you know. Right, it makes everyone across the whole system do the same thing, whereas up at, you know, White Marsh, they're doing one thing, mm -hmm. but then down at Piney Point, they're doing something else, okay. just based on what their team approach is within that school, mm -hmm. versus I think they're still getting to the same thing at the end of the school year, but it's just, it's pulling them to make sure that they're teaching kind of along the same marking period based mm -hmm. lesson. Okay. So, um, I, I mean, are, is that what, is Absolutely. that what you guys are, are it, it seeing really as well? The teachers <laughs> Hopefully. <focus on laughs> the instruction. The yeah. standard to be taught, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the only, the latitude is, is, is in uh, assessment of the standard. And even that, what we're finding yeah. is yeah. the meetings that they're having where they're all coming together, they're sharing the way that they're assessing, which then actually, uh, it's while it's a, a great deal of work at the beginning, once you have a, a, a base of all these similar assessments and very small that, the, that they're using, mm -hmm. then you really, the focus of the instructor is just on the instruction itself. And that's the same thing with the unified platform and with all these, you know, we're trying to move away from this model of back 20 years ago or 30 years ago where the teacher went in and taught a lesson that they were comfortable with with a resource that they that they enjoyed themselves and then created a, an assessment afterwards that may or may not have truly had any meaning to now it's like you know this is if you gave an assessment at the end of it it's like well so what standard did that assess mm -hmm. okay. and that's a really fan that's the exact conversation we should be having at all levels in every classroom with every educator. Right, well, because I think, you know, so some of the parents, you know, were frustrated with it, and mm -hmm. then I think some of the teachers were frustrated mm -hmm. with it as Absolutely. they first went through, but then as you went, you know, had more conversations with them, it's not that they weren't teaching what they were supposed to teach, it's just that they weren't aligning what their lessons were to the standards, so then when mm -hmm. it came time to do the first marking period, they're like, oh my goodness, like, there's right. all this data that now I have to fit in somewhere mm -hmm. so how enlightening to say well well this standard isn't in any of those standards <laughs> well perhaps that shouldn't 
<coughs> perhaps that's not the right fit. Perhaps that belongs in an earlier grade or a later grade or later in the year. <laughs> Right. <laughs> or perhaps it isn't aligned to right. any standard whatsoever. Right. So yeah, it's a great conversation. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. so, any questions? I want to thank you very much for working uh, with the committee on standards based. One thing I know about education: the norm is change. <laughs> we're always changing, mm -hmm. and we're changing to increase uh, student achievement and learning, and to bring more information to the parents so that they can understand it. I appreciate that you have feedback and input and you're taking that into consideration. And really it seems like this report card is aligned to the standards mm -hmm. that should be taught. Mm -hmm. So, it you be. <laughs> well before it was just math, A, B, mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. but this is more specific mm -hmm. in what the teacher should be teaching for the particular subject matter. So it is critical it is just specific to what should be taught mm -hmm. it is basically aligned to it so the teacher can I taught this and I look at my report card it aligns with this mm -hmm. so I'm meeting the standards that I should be meeting for my student is that typically what it's doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. yeah it's making them all more accountable so mm -hmm. absolutely um let me see what else I have to say And you're having professional development to help the teachers who are struggling with it. And parents can give any put, input by a variety of ways, and so can the teachers. So mm -hmm. thank you. It's been a work in progress. And you've been working on this how many years? From the beginning? Right? Since 2015. Since 2015. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you very <laughs> much. Um, the, I know that uh, when this started out, um, teachers were struggling um, with how to transition from what they had done previously to the standards-based report card. Are you finding that the earlier grades are, um, it's going more smoothly for them now? And how does their experience compare with how the third grade teachers have done with this? Yeah, they've been, they've been teaching standards-based for a long time. I think the, the report card was tweaked a little bit so that the report card and instruction matched. But our primary teachers are such a great resource to our intermediate folks who it's brand new to a lot of times. But um, I think primary folks are doing a great job. The K-1 and 2 teachers, uh, you know, with this and, and um, are really, I think their confidence in why it's right for students and the way they communicate with parents has been so beneficial for our third and fourth grade teachers to hear. And we make sure we have those opportunities for them to talk and collaborate. How did the first marking period, um, the, the workload for teachers in terms of putting together those standards-based report cards? It's too much. You know, the but the first time you do anything, it's a lot. Right. So we, uh, Lisa Bachner and Dr. Smith and Dr. Montgomery have been phenomenal about making sure we have opportunities for them just to talk with each other and calibrate and be able to um, make sure they have the, the documentation to populate the report card. So we're, they, teachers, it, it's taken a lot of hours, but I think they all know it's because the first time they've done it. So it will get better. We're giving them opportunities to try to, to streamline what they are working on, but we're absolutely keeping an eye on that and making sure they're not too overwhelmed. Did you bring the third grade teachers together after the first marking period to mm -hmm. sort of debrief, to yep. talk about yep. what worked and what didn't? We absolutely Just did. We had. Yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah, we have monthly meetings with our third grade, and last month, I think it was the day report cards went yes. home. So we really, you know, we so we were able to talk about, you know, how you did, the amount of time it, it took to do it. We talked about that, and then last night we were able to debrief on any parent feedback you've gotten and um, things like that. So it's a it's a really good group that are that are doing a great job sharing resources with each other. Very good. Thank you very much. And just before they leave, so just these two wonderful professional people will never sign up for another <laughs> thing ever <laughs> because things are supposed to end and you've been two years in and then we got fourth and then we got fifth and then uh -huh. quite frankly, you know, um, thank you for your tireless, poised professional leadership 
of all of the people who are doing this work. It really, it really is. It's it's quite something. And I, I will tell you, I've never had a greater confidence in third grade being uh, being taught so very well mm -hmm. and sure. being so aligned to standards and expectations. So. Um, I think we're going to see great fruit from this incredibly long labor. <laughs> and just thank you to both. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Dr. Jaffers, Ms. Faulkner, Ms. Long. 35. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Just saying. <laughs> well, it's so funny. I was talking to Dr. Montgomery. This morning, and w she had referenced that we had already done this presentation. Well, we kind of did. Because, well, because we've <laughs> I mean, we've really, seen it, we've we we've been through it, we've done we've we've seen it so many uh, times. It, it is, um, it's in our see the first it's in our sleep. <laughs> but here you are. <laughs> so we want to see how many different PowerPoint like. So this is a really good one. On this thing. is a really good one, and we and we hijacked some of it from <laughs> MSDE because they had really good boxes that fly in, and so. Maybe it's only thirty-five slides because you put arrows in. <laughs> no, <laughs> those are actually click points in the slides. There's probably like seventy-five to eighty different clickable <clears throat> points within the okay, deck let's itself. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so. so we promised yes, to be at the so thirty thousand foot level yes, here. So go. <laughs> Okay, so um, we talk about the ESSA, and ESSA represents uh, every um, student succeeds act it's since 2015, and uh, this is an accountability metric that MSD has put together over the last 18 months. Um, part of the measures of the system are as follows. Uh, we have academic achievement, um, we have academic progress, we have English language proficiency uh, bucketed into the 65% for academic achievement, then we have the culture and climate, school quality, school success, with the remaining 35 percent. Um, uh, again, the performance uh, composite for English language arts and math, you'll see some of the metrics being repeated <coughs> for high school as well. Um, the idea here is there's a performance component here uh, for English, uh, ERA, and math. And again, uh, there's two ways that we get points uh, in this metric, um, all generated from the park performance, um, which will move to the MCAT. Uh, it's uh, we get a percent proficiency of those kids that get fours and fives and we also get a performance index measure which is that is that group of students which are assigned points uh, based on our performance on this test so uh, coupling together that would make 20 percent and again this is all a derivative of our performance in park ELA and math uh, the other piece which I, I really feel that it, it's very uh, fair metric is this academic progress and again uh, 25 percent in elementary and middle school uh, is based on growth so that's why it sort of balances out when you're talking about uh, those schools that may have challenged populations they actually can get the lion's share of points in the growth category based on their um, on their growth from one year to the next and again uh, we're talking about only fourth grade through eighth grade students we need two years worth of park test data to get uh, any points any metric uh, in this particular category, and it's also for ELA and for math. And the way this works basically, uh, and this idea here is that um, it's called the student growth percentile. So if a student, um, let's say last year in third grade, scored a 725 on park math, um, every other student in the, um, in the state that scored a 725 would be compared with their performance on this year's park math performance. Uh, there needs to be a minimum end size of what a thousand students. You have to have a thousand students that have the similar score uh, to be compared accordingly. And and from that growth, we'll see if the growth was um, solid growth, um, or was it a little bit below the median growth uh, for all those students that scored the same on last year's park uh, performance. So can I ask a quick question? Please. Who is tracking that? You? I mean. I mean, or MSDE. MSD, it's it's oh. in the Pearson database. So yes. it'll really be accurate. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a Pearson. I did. That's database. why. <coughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That, that, that Getting works. punchy. Go ahead. <laughs> um, one of the other factors is um, credit for completion of a well-rounded curriculum, and this is a little bit different at both elementary and middle school. And this is the percent of students at elementary school that actually pass those courses, those core classes, the social studies, um, English, physical education, and health. 
Now, there aren't five points at this time factored into that. That will be next year because the MISA assessment will be part of that next year. Um, and then um, for the high school, excuse me, for the middle school, um, the same kind of things, the percent of students that are, are passing and getting credit for those courses, and you'll see there's 7% that will be added next year, and because for first eighth graders next year, they have two new assessments that will count next year. They'll have those, those the MISA, which will be 3.5 points, and 3.5 points also for the social studies assessment, which hasn't even been piloted, but will count next year for the first time. Which we haven't seen. Which we I haven't seen. Back to my database question. <laughs> <laughs> the next part <coughs> is English language proficiency. It's always been a subgroup, but now it's kind of out in front with our report card. And for elementary and middle school uh, schools, we count those students now. The school has to have a cohort of at least 10 ELL students that have been in the program for two years because they have to look at access testing for two years um, to do that. So that's what we're looking at, and they have to have a, a, a 4.5 or higher on that access test. So it's for schools that do not have a cohort of 10 students that have taken that assessment for two years, they don't have that score within their denominator, and Dr. Jaffers will get to how that denominator for each school is calculated in a little bit. And are we tracking that, or MSDE? MSDE, but of course, Dr. Jaffers' office is following through or verifying. Yes. <laughs> it's the files that we present. They translate what we send to them. So okay. Yes. Okay. And also part of the accountability system at 35% is the school quality and student success indicator. And that indicator is comprised of three measures, chronic absenteeism at 15%, 10% for the climate survey, and 10% for opportunities and access to a well-rounded curriculum. And Although we're looking right now at elementary and middle schools, the uh, chronic absenteeism and climate survey information that I'm gonna give to you is the same at the, for the high school level as well. Um, so for the first one, chronic absenteeism is a student is chronically absent if they are in membership for at least 10 days, but absent for 10% or more of school days in a given school year. Can I ask you a question about, because I, I read the definition which is the next slide about the definition of uh, chronic absenteeism. What about the student that is, like say, has a chronic condition and they move, do you have them moving in and out of home hospital so that, and is home hospital considered an approved off-ground site? It is, that's a great question, it is. And, and I wanna call your attention to that, the word absent and what it means because it's quite different from what we have been used to. So absent is unexcused and excused absences. Um, you have to, uh, you know, those absences being um, the ones that we have to think about are the ones that where a student is ill or suspended are considered absences um, under the chronically absent definition. So um, students have to be part uh, either on grounds in the schoolhouse accessing instruction or off grounds in home hospital is included in that. Uh, field okay. trips as well, activities School like that. School activities. Yeah. Okay. So what, what I want to um, note though for the measures for um, under ESSA is schools are going to be awarded points for chronic absenteeism for, this, for the percentage of students that are not chronically absent. Um, that's how the measure is going to be calculated. Um, another measure uh, under this is the climate survey, which is 10%. So the climate survey is, um, has four domains. As you see there, safety, environment, engagement, and relationships. And under each domain, there are about two to four topics in each of those domains. This year is a pilot year for the climate survey. It's not included in the calculations um, on, the S on the report card. Um, it was administered in um, October, and it will be administered again in February. Uh, the, um, the climate survey was developed by a steering committee at, at, uh, with MSDE. It was administered to students in grades five through 11 and to staff as well, and it's a web-based uh, program. The other part of the 35% is um, opportunities to access to a well-rounded, and you're thinking, well, I just feel well-rounded. How is this different? Remember, the other one was for credit. The kids actually pass those courses. This is just providing those opportunities that all students can access those, um, those courses. 
Um, and so in elementary, they are a little bit different. Um, percent of fifth grade students, and sometimes the measures are K through five, and other times they're, they're specific to a grade level. This one's specific to fifth grade students that are enrolled in science, social studies, um, fine arts, physical education, and health. And that's important that those, all, those courses are all offered and kids are enrolled in those courses. Middle school's a little bit different. We had one uh, thrown in that we hadn't probably seen before and, and been accountable for. And this is again for eighth grade students, and it's making sure that they're enrolled in fine arts, physical education, health, and computational thinking. Um, and we're still working with MSDE for that definition of computational thinking, and then working with our middle school and our staff to make sure that we're providing that. But that's gonna be some work on our end in the next few months to um, really digest and figure out how we're going to, some schools have those pieces, high schools definitely have those pieces, how we're going to make sure that we're fulfilling this requirement in the middle schools as, as part of the report card. So we said with the high school, and again, um, the high schools, um, again, th this metric, just to bring everybody's attention, the one takeaway today should be, this is a holistic measure of, um, of our schools. Before we would just have the park performance or the MSA in years past or HSA, now we have culture and climate coupled with graduation rate, coupled with uh, our park math like we normally do, and also with chronic absenteeism. So we have, we have a more of a holistic measure here. Uh, and again, these, um, you talk about academic achievement, same subscore um, except the percent that we allocate for points and academic achievement uh, is a little bit different for um, uh, high schools. We don't have the growth metric because uh, we have different tests here and we don't have that two-year sort of continuation. So um, they actually add um, academic achievement, which is exactly how we would describe um, uh, the middle school and elementary for math and ELA, but what's ni nice is they actually include the SAT portal. If students in 12th grade have 530 or higher on the math, we actually get credit for that uh, as, you know, so they may not have success in Algebra one or Algebra two on the park exam, but they are giving us success for 12th grade students that score 530 or higher on math. Um, uh, again, the graduation rate, this is 15% of our report card, 10% uh, of it, um, of which is our four-year cohort, um, and 5% uh, is those students that actually graduate in five years, so that's 15%. So 45% of the 65 uh, is pretty much, um, you know, academic achievement slash grad, grad rates, uh, which uh, we all perseverate on these numbers uh, quite a bit over the last couple of years. And then you'll see ELL as a, a, a section for high schools. It's a little bit different in that they're looking at, um, they have to have a 4.5 within six years rather than um, the, the year range at the elementary and middle school. But again, the same kind of stipulation in order to have ELL count as a percentage points in the denominator for any school, they have to have 10 students in the cohort um, who have to have at least been taking the access test for two years um, for this to count. Um, and then on track in ninth grade, um, and that is just like what we really saw with those fifth and eighth graders that got credit for those courses. Um, I think this is a great measure. It's how, what percentage of our ninth graders, and we've had lots of discussions about, you know, ninth grade really sets up our, 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 our success for the four year graduation rate, making sure they're passing those core content um, of mathematics, social studies, science, and English in that ninth grade year getting credit for those courses, and that's how we get that measure for each school. Um, and then for, again, you're gonna see the well-rounded, um, the, the, uh, the completion of the well-rounded curriculum. Is that where we're at now? I cannot see with my glasses, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and that's the students that actually, and I, I, and I do toggle between these two with it, you're gonna see it again in the 35%, but, but this is the percent of high school completers that are getting credit for those classes that they're, that they're taking. Now, a lot of this is predicated it's because we have such great pathways that we make sure that those kids are actually enrolled. So if they're a CTE student, they're in that pathway getting those credits for the CTE. We have dual enrollment opportunities and we have those AP classes. So um, those are giving credit for the students enrolled in those opportunities. It's not saying that we have every opportunity, but those every student has a pathway that they're getting credit for in order to achieve their diploma. I'm glad that they added the as Yeah, they did that this year. Um, I had a conversation with Dr. Salmon and asked why they had mm -hmm. chosen not to do so, pointed out that it was, um, that it, I thought it would be worthwhile for MSDE to um, take another look at that because um, 
and, and gave the reasoning. So I'm, I'm glad that um, she said they would follow up on it. It Absolutely. looks like they did. I'm, I'm very grateful. And they, they also have the seal of biliteracy on there too, right. and the certificate of program completion. Yes. All those are good things. Yes, absolutely. Um, that they have in that measure. Lots of different pathways. Yes. And for chronic absenteeism and climate survey as well, <coughs> um, the high school measures are consistent with elementary and middle school. And then we go back to again um, the the measure at the end of the um, school quality index, um, which is the um, the the opportunities and and this again is are we not only providing the opportunities but are kids enrolling in those in opportunities and so what we have to report and what we get a measure on um, for this category is not if they're passing those cre credits for graduation but is it are we providing the opportunities and then if we are providing those different opportunities for students are they taking advantage and what percent of students are actually enrolling in those opportunities that we're providing yeah, and I think it's important to clarify I know I'm MSD just set forth, I think they sent a letter to uh, Dr. Smith with regards to if we want to petition for more points. I think this is where um, things get lost in translation. Basically how we do things locally may not be interpreted um, up, at, up at state like we would like them to. So that's where we can sort of uh, haggle for some more points and I think we go through the superintendent's office for that. Well, and ultimately get credit for what we're really doing. The, the, right. the, the challenge that they're having is that they're gathering, you're asking where all this data comes from. Mm -hmm. Well, so the, the, the park scores is a data set that then goes into the Pearson machine and gets spun into sausage. <laughs> All of this comes from a massive file that we submit at the end of the year, the student course grade teacher, I think, mm -hmm. of, some, of that, which is every single child, every single course, every single grade, for the, and then they have to go through and parse out what it means. And a lot of this data isn't necessarily the AP stuff, the dual enrollment stuff, the CTE stuff might be in there, um, but then they have to determine who, you know, what is, the, what is the exact course. And we go back to the computational thinking. There's no Maryland core content curriculum standard for that. That's a made up, that's just something that somebody said, that's a, that's a, Computational thinking. <laughs> it's not like all, everything, all other courses are tracked back to very specific content standards. Um, but all of that has to be in these large files that then get generated through a process and it spits out a number at the end. And then it's incumbent, they don't, MSDE isn't going to go through to make sure that all the stuff's right. They send it back to us and then Dr. Fancella and Dr. Jaffers, and they start unpacking it to see whether we got all the credit that we should have. So we don't we don't horse trade for points, but we do get credit. We do make sure that we get credit for what we really are doing with kids. It's a better way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so just the, the last few slides. Uh, we don't want to get this sort of bogged down in the details, but I think it is important. There's two methods to um, that we acquire points. One is percent of a whole. It's like it's on park, you know, the percent of our kids that are proficient on math. Um, uh, or the second method, which is the assigned scores, you know, based on a certain calibration, uh, maybe comparison with other schools uh, across the state, uh, we are assigned points based on our performance. And they, um, and they sort of throw it all together and they statistically come up with um, a lot of their um, uh, assigning of points, if you will. So uh, th this slide is very, uh, it, it's very good because I think you can see the metrics for elementary and middle that are uh, sort of assigned points versus uh, those metrics that are um, given points based on percent of a whole. Um, the surveys you can see is the only one that sort of has yet to be determined um, because I think they're still working out MSD, they're working out the, um, the exact way to disseminate and um, uh, a lot points to LEAs. So um, this is the high school, um, you know, parallel uh, slide with how they are assigning points um, and again climate survey as you notice it's the only one that's sort of yet to be determined um, this idea of median uh, student growth percentile and assigned scores and, and I'm going to sort of go through these a little bit faster this idea here is um, most schools in the uh, across the state do offer well-rounded curriculum the issue is uh, some schools do it better than others and I think we are in comparison with every other high school middle school and elementary school across uh, the state. So there could be uh, a parsing of a, of a few differences and discrepancies uh, between getting the maximum points and getting something less than the maximum. So again, these slides just sort of uh, d display the, 
the, uh, the allocation of points, and you can see everything's pretty much slanted towards the upper tier. Uh, and they use a lot of what they call kintiles. So they split up the data in uh, groups of five, uh, and based on these groups of five, um, oftentimes uh, you get the, the lion's share of points uh, accordingly. So, um, uh, and again, this is what uh, you know Lisa was talking about. The measures don't apply this year. For instance, if you have a school that doesn't have an ELL population, uh, they wouldn't be. Um, you know that would their denominator would not reflect ten points. Uh, that other schools that have an ELL population would. So uh, again, Elise had mentioned and referenced the uh, science, uh, the MISA school, she referenced the social studies. Uh, Cheryl talked about the student survey not being involved. Those things are not calibrated and configured in this year's ESSA. Next year they will be. So um, we've added a link here. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's kind of important uh, if I could, you know, I can I will say this, so the assigned score, so the percent of a whole is similar. <coughs> I got seven out of 10, so I get seven points. The assigned points are I got seven out of 10, and then they compare to everybody else, and they don't give me seven out of 10 points, they might only give me two. For example, all of the chronically absent, there are 15 points available for chronically absent. And it's based on how many of your kids are not chronically absent. So if 85% of your kids are not chronically absent, then you would assume you'd get 11 or 12 points out of the 15 because it's based on a percentage. That's not how it's awarded. Instead, they said, well, most kids come to school every day, so we're not going to give you the full points. Instead, we're going to compare you to everybody else, and then we're going to give you less points. So even though we might have 85% of our kids not chronically absent, we don't get that point. We get what Maryland determined mm -hmm. the quintile most appropriate for us to be, so they only gave us like six points. It's a data manipulation on top of a data manipulation. It's not, it, it's, it's their distilling data to present the story they want to present. So much for transparency. Well, I, the thing is, whenever you have an assigned score, you're not, you're not, you're not truly reflecting the data. The data should be the data. Mm -hmm. How many kids are how many kids are chronically absent? 84%. Okay, that's the number, right? That should be the number. It's not, and that's been kind of the concern that we've had. Because chronically absent, the measure, is something that has only come about really in the last several years. It used to be average daily attendance was the standard by which we looked at ourselves. And all of our elementary schools and the majority of our secondary schools got the gold standard of 94% absent or present every single day. Now we have to look at chronically absent. And chronically absent at 10%, that's a brand new threshold. We would never had that threshold before. It used to be 25 days absent was chronically absent. And it does not take into account the, the reasons why you may be absent, which may be absolutely legitimately health-concerned absence. So uh, it's when we spend more time taking a look at the data, things like it being a percent of a whole or an assigned point that is something that really needs to be discussed publicly because why are you why are you, why would that be assigned points as opposed to percent of a whole i think it's a legitimate question and no one's been able to answer that other than the fact that they wanted to award credit the way they wanted to award credit i think when you hear assigned points i think what we have to think about is that's when we start to get comparisons with other schools mm -hmm. um, it's not just as scott talked about a, a flat percentage we're getting um, points allocated based on how we sort of measure up against everyone else in the state at the same level. So, um, that's the link that's embedded in the PowerPoint. Um, and you can see that's what, that's what they ask us to, um, uh, that's where everybody's gonna be asked to uh, sort of uh, link up to and access uh, over the next couple months, so. And if you type in just MD report card in any browser, it'll automatically direct you to that link. Actually, the link in the PowerPoint in Ford Docs is active, so it's okay. just not active here. <laughs> right, I've <laughs> just been okay. scrolling through the different. <clears throat> Sorry, you just made my comment. I'm going to go first. Um, first of all, great job to our school system based <coughs> on the, I hate to use the word ranking, stars. but stars <laughs> um, that our schools received, right? I know that there was a lot of information flowing back and forth prior to these report cards released because, which was 
kind of my point of questions because MSCE did not give us credit for things that we had simply because of Dr. Smith. The business rules. Right, just because they didn't understand what what we were doing or what we submitted or was classified wrong or whatever. So thank you to everyone who was under the fire to get that done in the before the report card came out. Um, I guess I just, even as a parent, I'm a little disappointed with MSCE that they pushed this through so quickly and I don't know how long they had to work on it. I don't know what their, you know, what their time frame was, but to have so many pieces that still weren't available, such as the student survey and you know things undefined. There's such focus on this from realtors, from politicians, from parents, from everyone comparing the schools, and to not have a complete, accurate picture, I think is extremely disappointing. Com and I'm talking completely as a parent. <coughs> you know. So, and I think it's probably, you know, our county fared pretty well, but I'm sure there's some that didn't, mm -hmm. and you know, and now they're gonna have to, you know, fight that perception mm -hmm. um, going forward. So, but anyway, hats off to, uh, to all of you who did a fantastic job in making sure the right information got to the right person so the right allocation of points was, was given. I know it was a lot. I, the, the one that's what I'll say is I think we have to, we have to realize this is a, a, an agile metric that changes year in and year right. out. So, so it's not like we can take we can rest on our laurels, but we have to continue to put the pedal to the metal because right. it will, the agile will change year to year. Right. So, all right, Jim. Uh, <laughs> you want to go first again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, no. Exactly. You, you can't. No. Oh, I, I, it's my turn now. <laughs> okay. Um, I didn't have any questions, but thank you. Yeah, I, I don't have any questions, and I'm going to say ditto to what Karen said. I just, um, uh, you know, as it was kind of rolling out to the end, you know, uh, there were too many unanswered questions and undefined criteria. So, but thank you for all your hard work. I would just echo what uh, Mrs. Bailey said and Mrs. Weaver. Uh, obviously, the, the end result is the teachers have got a metric that they can help measure the progress of the students. Is, is that a fair assessment? Um, on this, on the, we, we, have a, we have a no. <laughs> uh, I think we have a school um, metric. I think it's everybody owns this, so I think right. the system owns it. The school owns it. Um, it I, I could say all stakeholders own it. So um, I do think we have now a, a target, if, if you will, all stakeholders, not just teachers, but everybody's a target. Yes, you. Okay. That's all I have. Don't worry. Okay. I want to thank the three of you, Ms. Bachner. Ms. Long and Dr. Jeffers for doing this, a tremendous amount of work and presenting this to the board and to the citizens who will be looking at the Board of Education meeting and the additional link which they can look up for further information. It was a voluminous amount of work. Thank you very much. All teasing aside um, about the number of slides, um, <laughs> it, 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 it was a very comprehensive presentation on a very murky subject um, and it's clear that your passion is to do this and do this correctly and and for that I'm very grateful I'm sure the entire board is um, the idea of of judging we, we talk so much about the individual student and the importance of addressing each individual student and the control being um, closest to the student um, I'm struggling with the idea that we can assign a number of stars to um, over a, a series of measures that while you have explained them to us quite comprehensively, um, I think the, the tendency for people is to glance at something and go, okay, five, four, three, out of, you know, out of what, mm -hmm. and, and stop there. Um, we are so much about transparency and accountability, um, I don't know that this particular product as designed by MSDE gives us that, trans shows the transparency that we aim for um, in, a, in, a, in a way that is going to make sense to people. Um, and I think when you shorthand something, it goes lacking. Um, and a lot is lost in the translation. So 
I know that we, we this is something that is assigned by the state. We will abide by what the state says, um, but I think it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we continue to talk specifically about how our students are doing, um, the programs that are available to our students, who's um, utilizing those programs, and, and then showing how we determine how effective they are. Um, you know, shorthand doesn't work. I think it's ironic that we're going to a standards-based report card. <laughs> At the same time that the right, state's to going to a... Right, to give more information to parents so right. that students know exactly how they're doing and how they should be doing and... And what they need to do to improve. Right, right. And, and the state's going to stars. Right. Good for the state. Yeah. But, but I do think what, what Mr. Davis had asked me before about the teacher, I think it is raising awareness. Are, are we having more success in math or ELA? You know, and I think that it's, if schools have higher growth in math, vice, ELA, then that would raise their awareness that those are maybe metrics they have to focus on. I know Cheryl and her department's focusing on the chronically absent. So I, I do think there are some, we, the takeaways here can, can help us sort of improve I mean, upon what Absolutely. We it's just that so much of this is a moving yeah. target. Yeah. Yeah. You know, absolutely. park is going away, and then we're going to MCAP. And then yeah. I predict, you know, three or four years down the road, we're going to be doing something else. No. Um, <laughs> and I'm you just say that now. And, and I worry about middle schools. You know, as I said, eighth grade social studies next year, we're putting that metric in. As is Lisa, right, that's one. Lisa, right. Lisa and we haven't even done studies. a pilot yet. Yeah. Right. So I mean, those are those are things, as you said, that you know we're sitting here and we, we're very proud of all the work to get sure. the star ratings we have. But we could be sitting here next year um, with other star ratings, right. but not much different programming and. Uh, and progress and growth with our kids. You know, it's, it's, it is different targets every year. The yes. survey will add to the denominator, mm -hmm. whatever that survey. I don't think we're going to get 10 out of 10. I don't, well, who knows what 10 out of 10 might be. We don't know whether it's going to be a sign point or quint quintiles or what have you. And we were held harmless for the, for the computational thinking this year, and that'll come next. So you're going to add 20% to the denominators in middle school in particular, <coughs> and that, that's going to... That's going to change. I mean, all that. It's you know, quite frankly, it's all math. <laughs> <laughs> so sad thing with frankly, teachers. Quite frankly, it's all math. <laughs> right, and and um, you know, I like to tell the story of our schools, which is yes. resplendent. And <coughs> I love the fact that you, when you said when you shorthand, something goes lacking. It really is, and that's and it really is funny. We just we did just present on how important it is to give detailed, standard, aligned <laughs> feedback, and that it really helps you know how you're doing as opposed to just giving a B. Um, but, uh, based on a calculated percentage. Based, yeah, based on all of this thing. But I, you know, this is. I will tell you, it's been it's been really enjoyable to to be talking about all of this because we are really talking about performance <laughs> measures that we do examine every <laughs> single day with across the school system, mm -hmm. how our kids are attending, how our kids are being uh, are being successful, how they're performing in the programs that we have, how we're doing on state assessments as well as county assessments that foreshadow how we'll do on state. So. It's all good work. These are very good people. You have, you have very good people working on behalf of other very good people who are working on behalf of kids. And I think we see that um, often uh, when you come before us and when we see you um, as, you're, as you're doing your work. Um, I'm glad that we have that baseline mm -hmm. and that understanding instead of just depending on this. <coughs> Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, great. Jim, Jim, you should bring your notes. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Manders. <coughs> Don't go down now, Rita. We're almost at the end. <laughs> I should be right up here, shouldn't I? I don't know. <coughs> I hope so. Sharing on my end. <coughs> okay, Mr. Howard, is the rest there's of something you? I need to say to it nicely to make it show on everyone here? <coughs> Thank you. That should be oh, perfect. It was a lot easier than I thought. <laughs> Good morning, Board of Ed. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Again, my name is Denise Nandis. I'm Supervisor of Instruction of Academy Programs. 
and I'm here to give you an overview of the Academy application process uh, for the upcoming school year, the 2019-2020 school year. To start with the timeline, um, a lot of work goes in behind the scenes um, to compiling different matrices for review um, and the selection <coughs> of students for the academies. Starting in September of this year, we reviewed a database of required assessments that supervisors compiled. So our team looked through each of the assessments that every child, let's say, in grade eight, <coughs> countywide, would take. So we looked at our available measures. In October of 2018, I began meetings with our various academy application teams at the different school sites in order to select admission criteria based, of, based off of what we had available to us. Those academy application teams were comprised of myself, uh, various content supervisors for the respective academies, as well as school-based administrators and teachers <coughs> within the respective academies. Also in October of 2018, I was able to draft matrices um, and th those academy selection criteria, and I forwarded that to the Division of Instruction for review and feedback. In November of 2018, the matrices were finalized based on DOI and academy team feedback. So they, based on that team environment and that collaboration, we finalized those. And currently this month, um, in December, the Academy web pages are being updated to reflect the newly selected criteria um, for each Academy. So each Academy does have specific Academy application criteria detailed online. We also want to make sure we communicate um, and spread the word. Um, so early March of 2019, we have finalized our three dates for the Rising Freshman Orientation Nights at Leonardtown, Great Mills, and Chopticon High School. At those evenings, we offer the ability for students and parents and stakeholders to see staff of each of the four high school academies, the Global International Studies Academy, Academy of Visual Performing Arts, the Academy of Finance, and the STEM Academy, um, as well as to meet some of the students in those academies, ask questions, get more information. In early March of 2019, we also want to make sure that for the younger STEM potential applicants, that we allow them a chance to see the school, to see the academy, and to meet the <coughs> teachers and students. So we host um, open houses specific to potential STEM applicants, both at Lexington Park Elementary School and Spring Ridge Middle School. All of those dates have already been selected, so they're already determined. We also then um, have finalized our academy application dates for this year. So the application will open beginning Wednesday, March 6th. That <coughs> coincides with the first rising freshman orientation night, which will be held at Leonardtown High School. So that will open the online application. That online application is available in a myriad of places. Um, it's available off the main SNCPS site, each of the respective academy sites, as well as a hyperlink through a peach jar flyer that goes out to all schools. Friday, April 12th, the, at the application window ends. In the past, we've made it tax day, but tax day falls on a Monday, so we figured Friday was a little bit nicer, um, kind of coincides with spring break, and it gives a, approximately a nice five-week application window. So applicants have five weeks to attend the rising freshman orientation nights or the respective open houses look at the information that's presented online and through peach jar flyers and determine whether or not they would wish to apply. Friday, May 24th, 2019, that is the deadline, so some will be mailed beforehand, but that is the deadline for admissions decisions to be given to families, and those are done via email. In terms of the overall application process, again, students do apply online using Cognito Forms. We do have a couple of outliers each year. Um, we do have a PDF application available, so if a student or a family does not have access to that online platform, there is still a way for them to, to apply. Um, the nice thing about the online platform is it's available no matter where you live, and Lake is a testament to that. What state were you in before? I was in Arizona, and I can still use this um, program. <laughs> and so. she was able to apply to the Global yes. and International Studies Academy from out of state, so it is a nice um, platform. Again, it's open to SMCPS students, 
private school students. We do advertise to private schools. We do send flyers to private schools. Um, and we also invite them to their respective rising freshman orientation nights and open houses. Open to homeschool students and non-SMCPS students transferring in. Um, we are a very transient area, so we do have quite a few applicants from out of state and out of county. The application is nice also online. It can be saved and revisited. So it's not something where a family has to sit down and get it all done in one fell swoop. They can save it and come back to it and revise it as needed. And again, there's an approximation of about five weeks where students and families can apply. In terms of the selection process, um, after the application window closes in April, um, I then generate a list of everyone who applied for each respective academy, and I share that with the Office of Assessment and Accountability, and we start pulling the data. So those criteria, those measures that we determined for each respective academy, they get put into a very large, very, very large spreadsheet, and we start combing through to get scores. We then schedule school-based team meetings with the same personnel that were on the initial meetings in September and October. We meet at the school, department chairs, teachers, the um, respective administrators at the school, and content supervisors for each respective academy, and we meticulously go through the applications. So we look at not just the data piece, but we look at the essays, um, so those extracurricular activities, other grades or other assessment measures. We kind of try to get a whole picture of the child. Um, ABPA is a bit different. Um, ABPA, Academy of Visual and Performing Arts, being what it is, um, they actually have an audition component. So there's, the AB, I will advocate for the ABPA team. They work tirelessly. It's a whole week of after school auditions where they schedule each student by hand, individually, and they come in and audition either for theater, for the music of their choice, orchestra, band, um, or, um, what am I forgetting? Orchestra, band, I'm forgetting something. No, or chorus, um, and then theater as well. Um, so it's, it's quite in art. It's quite intense um, and quite time consuming, but it gives them a very good picture of that artist with which to use. Those are all scored by rubric. Um, so there are, in the end, numerical scores there as well. And then the cohorts are selected um, by those teams, and students not selected do remain on the wait list. They are notified that there is a wait list, and they will remain on that wait list, and if an opening should arise, they will revisit. When, once an applicant is selected, um, I send an email with a letter, and there are links to commitment and transportation forms. That just helps us keep track of who says yes and who says no. And the transportation forms are nice because it allows me to communicate with the Department of Transportation who will ride each respective hub bus, which is very nice. They like that. They get nice little binders of who, they, especially for our elementary school and middle school students that utilize that service um, in the event of an emergency or something, they have that information. Applicants then will confirm or deny the spot um, by June 10th, 2019. And that's nice because it allows me a little bit of time before the end of the school year to possibly revisit the wait list should there be any additional seats. And I can fill those seats and get students and families notified earlier. It also helps the feeder schools with planning and, and staffing. And we did, um, certainly we are reflective. Um, there were quite a few parent meetings that we've had, meetings with staff. Um, and there was a survey actually included in Cognito Forms last year. So once an applicant applied to an academy, they had the option to complete a survey um, of, about the overall process. So we looked at all of that information, um, and we did inst institute a couple of changes for this year. Um, we are having specific parent meetings for current STEM students and families both at Lexington Park Elementary School and Spring Ridge Middle School, respectively. And the purpose of those meetings will be specifically to review the application criteria with families that are interested in applying to the next level of STEM. So answering any questions, making sure everything is transparent, um, and those meetings have already been scheduled. Both are occurring in January, so well in advance of the application window. We also, uh, based on feedback, we decided that we, and we were very fortunate this year, we have a, a, a myriad of more local assessments to choose from. Um, our content supervisors have done a great job, and with the adoption of some of our new curriculum pieces, we're going to be using more of the local assessments in the data matrices this, this year. Um, and again, based on feedback, uh, less emphasis on the, there's still an emphasis, but less emphasis on the Naglieri and or Park tests. Um, some of the feedback was that there was a heavy weight given to one measure. 
And so we're using more of the local assessments, which are more relevant and timely, and a little bit less of a measure, even though those are our only normed criteria um, and we're still using them, less emphasis on those. So we did take that feedback to heart. Um, Cognito Forms is also this year going to include a checkbox. So before the applicant can fully submit their application, they are going to be redirected based on what academy they are applying for to the SMCPS website where there is clearly delineated application criteria. So they are going to reaffirm that they have reviewed that application criteria prior to submission. So we make sure that every applicant clearly knows what is expected and what will be looked at as part of that application. And so that site will be, again, automatic to co incognito forms. What Lastly, about PDF forms? I'm sorry? What about the PDF? PDF forms, it's not, going to, it's not going to link that. So it's going to be more of just a blanket statement um, where they'll have to check that they have reviewed. And I will provide the um, address, the URL. Um, pardon me. Sorry. That's OK. Um, and lastly, um, change current STEM students who will not be selected for continuance into STEM 6 or STEM 9 will receive a phone call from the academy supervisor myself prior to receipt of a letter. Um, we're also making sure that we are having um, copious meetings um, if needed, if we are noticing that a student um, is struggling in any, any of the academies um, per, we call it our academy review team process. In terms of communication to stakeholders, we want to make sure that this information is in multiple places and is stated multiple times. So the SMCPS Academy's website, there will be many links to the application off that page. We also will conduct a press release that again will get sent to all um, non-public schools as well so that those students are aware. We will have a main banner on the SMCPS website starting about a week before the application process where really a parent can go smcps.org and click right there to apply. Um, we also will do a school messenger all call and now text option by principals. I do send a peach jar flyer twice. Um, that peach jar flyer goes to all schools because elementary, middle, and high school um, students are possibly interested. Um, and there is a direct hyperlink through that electronic peach jar flyer where, again, families can go right to the application. There will be STEM open houses at Lexington Park and Spring Ridge Middle School. And again, those rising freshman orientation nights at all three high schools. We're really just trying to convey the amazing work that is going on in our academies and hopefully garner more interest in having more applicants to those programs. Questions or comments about the process this year? Anyone want to go first? <laughs> Jim. I have a question, but very impressive. Thank you. I just want to say that I really loved your presentation and that um, I can truly speak to all of the programs that you work with. You do a fabulous job with all of them, and I know it, it takes extensive work. Um, and I love the process that you've put in place. It's so easy to use. And if I can find it when I'm living 2,000 miles away, I promise you someone in this county can find it, no problem. So you've really done a great job with it. Um, the only thing that I might say, or just suggesting wise throughout like your process of um, selection, have you all thought about implementing like a shadowing day for students who might be um, either interested or who've already been accepted for students to go um, over to the program on like a specific day and maybe like see what's going on in the classrooms, maybe have um, like them already know that they're going to have a shadowing day at the um, whatever um, program is there, like say GIS, and they can be already ha like they have a planned, I guess, schedule of or type of day of what they're going to be having and then have the shadow students come in and see what it's like. I haven't looked at that. Um, we have taken various students from the academies into the feeder schools. So we've taken three or four, let's say, global international study students. We go over to Leonardtown Middle, Esperanza Middle, et cetera, and we schedule time to talk with all eighth graders who might be, actually all eighth graders. Um, I go specifically into eighth grade classrooms um, myself, although I'm nowhere near as informative or interesting as students who actually live the life. Um, but that's, that's something certainly to contemplate because um, it isn't, I don't know that a necessarily a 45 minute presentation at a rising freshman orientation night does convey kind of the day in the life of. Right. Right. Um, what we do for STEM is we bring the high school students into STEM middle school to speak di directly to them. And then we also put the STEM eighth graders on a bus 
and we take them over to Great Mills to kind of live that mm -hmm. life. Um, it's not, it's a little bit trickier when you've got all eighth graders and all four possibilities and we don't have those feeder programs in the middle school for the other three academies, but certainly something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No questions, but thank you for uh, going through and revamping and figuring out really what is needed for each of these programs. <coughs> Excuse me, and I think it's really neat that Lake was able to access yeah. this from another state, so I was unaware of that. I'm telling you, it's the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> I finished sure. about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Madam Chair. Just making sure you have all of your time for questions. Um, I don't have any comments. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, I want to thank you for uh, adding the personal touch by um, calling the family specifically <laughs> that the student is will not be selected for the program before they receive a letter. Um, also, I thank you for the constant communication that you have with the parent if the student is falling behind so there won't be any surprises. And I want to thank you for taking, soliciting, and taking in consideration the input, input that the parents gave you regarding improvements to the program. Thank you being open uh, to listening to them and taking some of their considerations. So I appreciate all the hard work that you have done it's wonderful. I could comment on everything that's in here, but I won't because I don't want to take that much time. But your presentation is excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I love the fact that we're, we've been able to um, bring our Pathways programs to this level um, through the academies. Uh, like Mrs. Washington, I appreciate that you took the feedback from families um, and considered mm -hmm how you might make changes to the program. Um, I, you know, there's something to be said for um, the passion of students who participate in these programs. Um, and also the fact, really, I guess, STEM related, um, that students each year have, if you will, skin in the game that, um, you know, we, I know we've had students who may, you know, went through the middle school level of STEM and then decided that they wanted to do something different, um, that they had enjoyed it, but perhaps to continue to pursue it um, was, was not in line with what they thought they wanted to do. And the opportunity is, has been said here before, the opportunity to, dis to discover that in middle school or high school before you go on to college and really um, go in depth into a, a field of study and a career path I think is very valuable for students as well. Um, so thank you for continuing to look at all of these programs and to consider um, where improvements might come about. Thank you. Yeah, it gives people a chance to try things on. Mm -hmm. um, all of these pathways are above and beyond. Um, they are what makes St. Mary's County Public Schools so exceptionally special uh, and, and really able to tailor to the, you know, the accelerated learner, the, the learner that, that needs really that encouragement and uh, challenge. Um, but these are all extra things that we do. We were talking with the commissioners earlier at the joint meeting. And they were saying, you know, well, if you don't get the money to fund a negotiated agreement, well, then what are you going to do? What are you going to cut? Um, there are so many things that St. Mary's County Public Schools does uh, above and beyond for our kids that make us special. Um, I think this will be a really interesting year when we're talking about budgeting if we're presented with the this or that kind of an ultimatum um, because we don't ever want to take any step back from the incredible things that we offer our children. As I said yesterday um, in conversation with someone from the base who had had his children in uh, Fairfax County Public Schools over um, a period of six years off and on, um, he said that uh, there they didn't want to go to school. Here 
and one in middle school, one in high school, they, they love going to school. They get up in the morning, they want to go to school, and it's because of the programs we have in place. Um, I think that speaks volumes about the school system, the attractiveness of it, uh, and I would not like to see us step back from what we're doing. When you see what students are getting from these programs and how they're able to share that, it is mind-boggling. Um, and uh, turns out that education is not an expense. It's not really? an expense. It's education expensive. is an investment. And there is no greater investment than anybody could make than in Miss Meadows. I, I invest <laughs> in you. We invest in you and your like. Because that really is the incredible future. And, and so thank you very much for your warm words about the GIS and STEM and all and the AVPA and and certainly we see the culminating of uh, the impact of AVPA um, when we have our kids singing in the White House. <laughs> you know, that's and their capstones are coming up next and week. I can't. Oh, we can't wait. That's right before we go to break. And, and we get to go. And stellar, amazing, professional, quality performance. I encourage all, anybody awesome. who doesn't believe that we are investing well to come out to Chopticon to see those incredible performance. Um, opportunities Last year, really amazing. Amazing. Yeah. amazing and I can I can attest to Lake as well who stood up about what six weeks ago approximately mm -hmm. yes. and did basically a graduate school level presentation on a year's worth of research in such a professional manner and it's it's really awe inspiring what our students do yeah truly thank you yeah you're gonna be better leaders than we ever thought to be <laughs> thank you thank, thank goodness for that <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Mandis. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Ms. McCord is. Ms. McCord is under the weather, so we have Mr. Springer. Come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Let's see if I can pull this up here. Okay, apologize. You get the backup quarterback today. Oh, Redskins fans, we're used to back up the backup. Well, hopefully not the Mark Sanchez backup. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, but, hopefully uh, not. We'll, we'll see. So, all right, the exciting uh, November financials, and I apologize if you've heard of this before with October, September, what have you. Uh, we'll start out with the revenue first. The um, county is on, on schedule with their payments, paying half of um, – everything they're due for uh, four payments and they've paid two so far so we're right at 50 percent the um, interest we can see here we're just about where we budgeted um, like last year if rates hold and cash flows um, kind of hold steady with what we're doing we'll probably near double that by the end of the fiscal year obviously that all depends on the market and everything else um, but that would be that would be a good thing that's a really good point. So we're, we publicly disclose the interest that we earn on our holdings, Correct. right? So we publicly disclose that you know we budget about two hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars as interest just on our holding. It's a very good number to have, and it's a challenge too because as of right now, you all are in the twenty twenty budget cycle, and how do you how do you budget you know for seven months from now, twelve months from now? So it's you know probably better to be conservative, but you know, it is, it is what it is. I remember 10, 15 years ago, we were in that half million dollar range, which is yeah. really nice, right. but you can't always count on that. So um, the transfer pensions, those are coming, that's uh, the retirement accounts, uh, or the retirement costs for investments as it were, um, that goes to our grants. So we'll be booking that via journal entry shortly for half the year, but most of that comes in towards the end of the year, but that's no reason to be concerned since it's zero right now. Uh, state revenues, the state also has paid three, uh, three of its six, so they're on track by 50%. Obviously the handicap is the medical assistance and then the non-publics are based on actual, so those are estimates, but based on, on history. No reason to be concerned right now with those. Uh, federal, federal's on track as far as federal can be on track. Uh, the DOD component of impact aid comes in in August. We're usually notified early August, late July. So we can do that accrual, and then the regular impact aid monies. There, it's a challenge when the feds are going to pay us, and they can't tell us ahead of time when they're going to pay us or how much they're going to pay us. So, 
again, best estimates. But overall, you can see 51%. We're right on track for half the year. Uh, so the revenues look pretty good. The investments section, um, I don't have any concerns or issues. I checked with Tammy, uh, Ms. McCourt. She didn't have any to share as well. Obviously, there's a lot of encumbrances still at this time of year. But overall, everything is on track. Uh, no concerns there. And then we've got uh, quite a few of investments, obviously. I'm playing off your words of Dr. Smith that investments <laughs> versus expenses. Exactly, sir. So anyhow, and then we've got um, some budget transfers that happened during the month. Gotcha. So very exciting stuff. Uh, are there any questions? Jim. No. <laughs> <laughs> No questions, but I did want to um, point out that we were able to reallocate funds to go to the evening high school, which yes. I think that's yeah. very important. So I was glad that we were able to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for that. No questions. No. All right. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thank you. All right. Does anybody have anything else? All right. Uh, I do. Oh. I just wanted yeah. to put a plug for... Great Mills High School, it's a wonderful life that's coming up this, I think it's Thursday. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and then they're going to, I think they're repeating as well, my students. Right. So I'll be there, I think I'm going to go on Thursday, <laughs> not Friday. All right, and with that, we are adjourned. Or, oh, wait, our next meeting is January 16th. Here at the night. Oh, 16th. Yes. Yes, at January 9 a.m. 2019. Yes. Everyone have a good holiday. Be safe and enjoy. We're done.